Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this Board of Supervisor meeting to order. The time is 6.30 and the date is May 18th. I will tell you I've been chairman now for about four months and this is the first time I've started on time. So I'm usually a few minutes late because board members are out talking, not my fault, for sure. <laughs> Throw them under the bus if you can, right? So I, I would ask everyone to please stand. I'm gonna ask Mary Ann Lee, our Health Services Director, if she'd step forward and lead us in the pledge, if you don't mind. And then please remain standing for an invocation by Pastor Lance Lowell from Neighborhood Church. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, we come before you today and we thank you for your mercies. Thank you for helping our leaders and our communities endure this pandemic. Thank you that we are seeing signs of better days to start to happen. We continue to pray for your protection and provision for those that are most high at risk and vulnerable among us. Lord, I pray you give these leaders tonight uh, wisdom uh, and that you will help them to uh, dictate and to govern the important matters that are at hand. Give them strength, creativity, and courage to take on the challenges that face our communities that are often complex and difficult. Give them vision for the planning for the future that will be a blessing to this county. I pray that you'll bless them for their service to our county. Lord, we thank you for the great community we've been given. Help us to continue to learn to be gracious to each other, especially when we have different opinions. Help us to be walk in forgiveness and not offense. Help us to have strength to make choices that will lead to unity and loving our neighbor. Help, our, uh, help us work with these leaders that you've given us to make positive changes as we move forward. I ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, Marianne. So we're gonna move on to a presentation. It's the accommodation of the 2021 Stanislaus County Outstanding Senior Citizen of the Year in celebration of Older Americans Month. And Lil Castellano, President of the Stanislaus County Commission on Aging, will be presenting. Good evening. Hello. Good evening, Chairman Tesla, board members, Mr. Hayes, and Mr. Bullis. My name is Lil Castellano. I am the president of the Stanislaus County Commission on Aging. It is my honor this evening to introduce the 2021st Stanislaus County Outstanding Senior Citizens. The month of May is officially recognized as Old Americans Month throughout the nation. And senior citizens around the nation are being recognized for their contributions to our country. Stanislaus County joins with communities nationwide in celebrating this month. Tonight, the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors is recognizing four senior citizens and one senior couple from each of the five supervisorial districts for outstanding volunteer work in their respective communities through their volunteer work. They have enriched the quality of life for all county residents. On behalf of the Stanislaus County Commission on Aging, I thank these outstanding senior citizens, thank them for their contributions. They are truly an inspiration to all of us. We will now introduce these people. The first one will be from District 3, Mr. Charles Homburg. Okay, we've got to hold off on the pictures till we finish the talk here. <clears throat> well, Charles, congratulations on this. We, it, it's, an, it's an honor to be up here with you talking about this. We have a, little, we have a certificate in, um, from the Board of Supervisors and I think from Josh Harder's office also. 
But we have a little um, information sheet that we, it talks a little bit about you and what you do. And I just wanted, I went through and kind of highlighted some of the things that I could see. And I'm going to start off with um, your veteran, uh, your um, United States Marine Corps. And so I kind of started off with that and I could see that at the beginning. And then as I read everything else through here, it makes sense. I could just see all the, your service and, and you know, you're, you're willing to serve our country and I can just see it continues throughout your life here, what you've done. So some of the highlights that I can that I want to hit here, advocating for residents living in long-term care facilities. And as I told you out there, this hits home for me, for, for others of us here. I, recently, my mom is um, 86 years old and has moved into a long-term care facility. And so um, a lot of concern and anxiety comes along with that when, when you take your parent and all of a sudden um, put them in the hands of someone else. But I can see it's someone like you who is very self-giving um, that helps with those situations and help people in those facilities when their family can't be there. So I can see, anyway, right off the bat that, that you're serving there and, and helping in these facilities. Um, it, it talks about how you inspire volunteers um, by your professionalism and effective work that you do. You help other people. And it looks like you do a lot of training for other people to do the work that you do. You're an ombud ombudsman. And, um, and I can see that Others are inspired by the work that you do, and, and so that's another great characteristic that you're doing. And you know, you think when you go through your life and you do what you do in your job, you, you, you raise your kids, whatever, as you get through all of that, then you think, okay, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm done. I've done my time here, and I'm just going to rest. But, but you're not doing that, and that's what um, is so commendable for what you're doing here, and when we can see. Um, and then as I see here during the COVID, you continued um, to do the work in these facilities, which doesn't surprise me one bit. I mean, I, you know, you, you join the Marines, you, you run into danger, is what you do. And, 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 and that's exactly when I think of people that still continue to do their work and continue to, to try to help others, um, even during the COVID, even during the pandemic, at your own, you know, potential peril. And so I got to commend you for that, for, for the work you've done there. It says that you were, um, your caseload, um, 12 cases, you were still keeping 12 cases a month during COVID, normally um, 30 cases a month, but still to be continuing out there in, in the heat of this, um, this COVID battle, it's, um, it's amazing. So, so I want to thank you for everything you do and, and, and this for everything you do for this community. We've all got to just be proud of, 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 of what you do out there and it just, you know, we, we hear nothing but bad news, it seems like, in the paper. That's all we get is the, or, the, or on TV and the reports that we get. But there are so many good people out there um, doing good things, and you're a perfect example of one of those. So I thank you for everything you do. I'm going to let you talk for a little bit here. We only need about 45 minutes out of you. <laughs> well, I'll, one of the questions I'm always asked is, what is an ombudsman? And I just say, yeah, sure. It was uh, something that... Uh, was developed in Sweden back in the 1800s uh, as an individual in a village that was an advocate for the citizens. Uh, the, the citizens felt free to be able to go to that person and uh, with their concerns and their cares and, and the ombudsman would then uh, investigate it and resolve it. And that's come down to be a uh, ombudsman in the long-term care and skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we're advocates for the residents of those facilities and work diligently to try to resolve their issues. And uh, it's, a, it's a very rewarding job. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> and on behalf of the Board of Supervisors and, and Congressman Harder, these are our certificates. Okay, pictures now. <laughs> Mr. Merlin Mel Newman. Good evening, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of honoring Mr. Merlin Newman, also affectionately known as Mel. And Mel, I'm not nervous, but I am a little giddy 
because I get to the opportunity, I feel like I'm at show and tell and get to show off one of our community assets. So thank you for giving me that privilege and honor. As I read your accomplishments and things that you've done in the community, I was amazed nonetheless and really appreciative that we have people like you in Stanislaus County that have done so much, not only for the region, but for our nation. Your service in the United States Navy as a corpsman during the Korean War. During his service, this one got me a little teary-eyed, buried alive for almost five days after a mortar hit. He was bounded, wounded, and removed the shrapnel himself. So it goes without saying you're one tough cookie. I get that. Um, and then this one, I, I really, I really want to know more. We're going to have to do coffee and a follow-up lunch on this one. But he had the pleasure of attending to Marilyn Monroe when she suffered from pneumonia while performing service in Korea. So let's save that one for a later date. And I want the PG version. I want the PG version. Um, Mr. Mormon served uh, uh, as a member of the McHenry Mansion, an asset of our community for 40 years. He was on the acquisition committee, president of the YMCA Men's Club, a role model in the local gay community for nearly 60 years. Traveled to San Francisco every weekend to work alongside legendary supervisor Harvey Milk to support a population that many at that time did not want to support. So thank you so much for doing that as well, Mel. Uh, Mel also helped build the church, building of College Avenue United Church of Christ, and he's been a member of that for the last 12 years. But I would be remiss, and I know you agree, your biggest accomplishment is marrying your spouse 54 years, John Crabb. So again, it is my distinct honor, and I truly feel privileged, not only to call you a friend, but to give you the certificate from the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors, Congressman Harder, couldn't have gone to anybody better in District 4. Thank you so much, Mel, for everything you've done, continue to do. You're a role model and inspiration to many. Thank you so much. I'll do a hug. I'm just worried about you. I'll do a hug. Uh, so, please feel free to say whatever you want, and then take a few pictures. I really don't have anything more to say, but I do love Modesto and the people therein, and they've always backed me and helped me, and never once did they ever throw a stone at me or anything else. Um, a few bucks here and there, but yeah. But I, I enjoyed, I enjoy Modesto, I enjoy all you people of Modesto. Thank you for accepting us as being people as we are. And it's with great love and honor, and I want to thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And even with a, a garter belt on, okay? Thank you, thank you, the very best. God bless. Pictures. I'll try to make the picture look good. I'll do my part. You're already doing yours. Do you mind? Uh, do you mind taking off? Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Love you. Stop. Just stop. Oh, sorry. Most important. So everything I've said in the commendation is all written here. So on behalf of the Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors, recognizing Merlin Noman as outstanding senior citizen of Stanislaus County for District 4. And this is from our esteemed Congressman, Congressman Josh Hart. I'm sure he sends his best wishes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next will be District 5, Mr. Ron Swift.
It's an honor to uh, recognize Mr. Swift. Uh, he's been a, a friend and a family friend for numerous years now and has been a pillar of the Patterson community for decades. And he's been an inspiration of mine. Uh, whenever I had a, a problem or inquisition about what's going on in Patterson, I would call two people, Lieutenant Colonel John Azevedo and Ron Swift. They always had the skinny on what's going on in the west side. Uh, but Mr. Swift has uh, volunteered for over 31 years for the Boy Scouts of America Troops 81 and 82. Uh, Mr. Swift and friends started Troop 81 in 1978. And uh, Troop 82, which was developed by Mr. Swift, was dedicated to boys with special needs. Mr. Ron Swift was also often noted as inspiring with his dedication to lead others, adults, to become troop leaders and help them develop their leadership skills and service to Boy Scouts of America. For his efforts, he was recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017. Mr. Swift was also a founding member of the Patterson Apricot Fiesta, which I'm biased, but is probably the best parade in the county. Mr. Swift has notably served as past president of the Patterson Lions Club and as a member for 43 years. He was also a member of the Masonic Lodge for 63 years and a member and past president of the Patterson Wesley Chamber of Commerce. <coughs> Mr. Swift served as a founding member and curator of the Patterson Township Historical Society Museum from 2010 through 2016. And I also want to note, he wrote a column called Fast Talk for the Patterson Irrigator for 57 years. And I would always eagerly uh, await for the weekly article to come out to see what Mr. Swift thought about the issues going on in Patterson. Because if you know Mr. Swift, he has an opinion and usually he's right, he's right on. And uh, I, would, I would quote Mr. Swift walking door to door on a regular basis. I said, well, you know, Mr. Ron Swift, he's usually right about this, and he usually was. But he is a pillar, and I admire him greatly. I want to recognize his family for being here tonight. And uh, Mr. Swift, it's such a distinct honor to recognize you, and thank you so much for your friendship through the years. All I wish to say, <clears throat> really, is that all volunteers do so with the knowledge that they are taking something probably away from their family. And in my case, I, over the 30-some years, I, I logged over 550 nights of Boy Scout camping. And you figure that's, that's uh, a year and a half away from home. So I thank my family who are here tonight, two of them, and uh, I thank our community for, for putting up with that column for 57 years. <laughs> thank you. And here is your recognition on behalf of the Board of Supervisors and on behalf of Congressman Josh Harder. Thank you, sir. District 1, Mrs. Diane Talbot. My honor to be down here with you, Mrs. Talbert. You know, I was as I was going through everything that she does, 
and what she has done, I started second guessing myself for what I do with my spare time because she is one busy lady. Hey, can you point your husband out for me? Are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> so here's what Diane does for the veterans for the last 54 years after losing her two brothers during Vietnam she and her sister vowed to greet every plane arriving home to ensure the Vietnam soldiers received a proper welcome organized a countywide free veterans day lunch for the past 14 years spent the last 14 years providing assistance to veterans in Oakdale and Riverbank. Includes ride to doctor's appointments, shopping, house cleaning, yard work, home repairs, special focus on homebound veterans. Thank you for doing that. Assisted with veteran stand down events in Stanislaus County for the past three years. She takes veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder to an annual event at the Kennedy Meadows in Sierra Nevada mountains where they enjoy camping and fishing. Serves as a member of the Veterans Foundation Board. She has spent the last 12 years providing free weekly senior brunches in the Riverbank group. Diane has assisted with Toys for Tots for the last four years and has volunteered with Women's Haven providing care packages. Her husband has dressed, her and her husband has dressed as Mr. and Mrs. Claus to serve, to give guests at Storia Adult Daycare for the past 12 years. Incredible. Stanislaus County congratulates you on your service and dedication to the people of Stanislaus County and the seniors here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Would you like to say a couple words? Um, I like I, it says in there, I started very young being an advocate for veterans. Uh, and I followed through them. I was an EMT for many years in Oakland. I grew up in Oakland and I went through all the bad times there and stuff and it just carried forward. I always believe in paying back and I've done so and I drug my husband into it with me. <laughs> he didn't know what volunteering was. He was this little country boy doing it and now he knows. <laughs> but I appreciate it. I love the people I work with and the people in the county and uh, I continue to do it until I can't do it anymore. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Board of Supervisors and Josh Harder, our Congressman, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, oh, that. Thank you. Can we get some pictures? Would you like your husband to come down? He won't come down. He doesn't like Our next one will be District 2, Mr. and Mrs. John and McLean Clerch. Good evening, all. So we do some uh, presentations like this from time to time on the Board of Supervisors, but I, I can assure you Supervisor Withrow has been here for 10 years, and this is our favorite night of the year. It really is. When we talk about seniors, first of all, I'm, I'm very close to being a senior. I'm getting AARP stuff in the mail now, but <laughs> it, it is truly the greatest generation. We talk about it all the time. Uh, the people that are servants, true servants of the community, volunteer. I, I can't thank you all enough. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It is uh, true dedication, and I hope that, uh, that I have the same well when I'm not doing this job anymore to uh, serve the public. I, I do like that you took your mask down. I'd really like to talk with my mask down, if that's okay. You okay with that? Okay. You can hear me better. So, what we have here are two volunteers from District 2, and I, I just I, I marvel when I listen to the stories. So the, the, Claridge, the Claridges, as we do plural, the Claridges have spent time at United Samaritans. It's been one of their main focuses. United Samaritans Foundation for the last four years, serving others and dedicating their time and community 
Uh, they're considered beacons of hope and working in tandem as a husband and wife team. So we get, we get two for the price of one. And you know what that price is? Free. And they tenaciously offer their love, time, and commitment uh, for flu food recipients that they serve for those customers in need. So they started in 2018. Uh, they wanted to tackle a need of serving food, and it was mostly on the west side. And they originally grew up, right, in Newman, a lifelong resident uh, of, of Stanislaus County, but they handle the Grayson, Patterson, Newman area. Uh, they're solely responsible for driving, uh, delivering food around. And I think they've put on eight, John's put 8,000 miles on the truck, uh, <laughs> delivering food to and from the Turlock area, if you know where United Samaritans is. So when they started, they were delivering 804 meals in August of 2018, and currently in March of 2021, they're delivering over 3,000 meals. Now, you think of the time it takes on a continual basis to deliver 3,000 meals while moving around the whole time. And, and, and so originally, I think when, when you were chosen, I had, I had received a message from the clerk of the board saying you couldn't be here tonight, you were going to be on vacation, and so I quickly turned around and, and asked the clerk, can I get to your house before you go on vacation, not realizing you were already gone. And, and so they made it back for tonight. I found out just a couple of days ago they were going to be here. So uh, when I, I just met them right over here and I said, uh, so where did you go? To, you know, San Luis Obispo, Shasta, where, you know, how far? And they were back east uh, just a couple of days ago and drove back across the United States, not flying, driving across the United States. So I understand where the 8,000 miles of driving the truck. <laughs> But back east, and went up north to Boise, is that, and then to Reno, and then they got here last night just to, to be here. So the dedication, they love to travel, and, and they don't want to talk tonight. So I asked some questions about where they like to travel. They've been around the United States a couple of times, and uh, spending time together. And really, that's what it comes down to in life. But your, your, your servant attitude, uh, and, and just by reading this, all of the the things that that are written about how uh, love non-judgmental giving people hope is truly inspiring to me and when you guys uh, so you're a lifelong resident you said 40 40 years now she's 41 tomorrow and <laughs> yeah. so happy birthday but we just again we just appreciate uh, all of your your time and effort and, and again uh, on behalf of the board of supervisors favorite night of the year and I look forward to you guys being beacons for myself, showing me what, what true servantship is all about. So I'm not going to, okay, you're ready, I like it. <laughs> I think the funny thing about tonight is we thought we were getting this award because we were serving seniors, not because we were seniors. <laughs> so it's ser seniors serving seniors. <laughs> And we just enjoy our work. It's almost embarrassing to be up here because we, like everybody else, we love what we do so very much. And we've been blessed many, many times over what we give. Um, we had somebody, one of our people call us today to say he was going back to work. He'd been on uh, leave and he just wanted to say goodbye to us. He wasn't going to see us because he had gone back to work. And that just really touched our heart that someone took the time to call us and say, we're going to miss you guys. So I just want to, you know, I want to thank God that we have been given this gracious opportunity to serve. And we just couldn't be happier. So on behalf of the board and the congressman, we have a couple of uh, certificates for you. And then we're going to take a quick picture. big hand for all of them. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our supervisors for honoring these wonderful seniors and hopefully we'll see some of you being honored here as seniors. So. <laughs> So just so everyone knows, Liliana is, serves on STANCOG on the social services, transportation. Yes. Uh, and I, I just turned tack. 84, so it doesn't mean that you have to be old to enjoy life. 
So you have to enjoy life. But you're doing the same thing. You're you're giving up your time to make the community better. We appreciate it too. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. Thank you. Just so you know, you don't have to stick around. This would be a good time to make a run. Okay, next we're going to move on to item five, an update regarding the 2019 novel coronavirus. Uh, Marianne will be presenting. Thanks for leading us in the pledge with no notice. <laughs> Gonna, when you get it up, hold for one second. Yeah, I guess there's no, no action. I would go. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. I'm Mary Ann Lilly. I'm the Health Services Agency uh, Director, and I'm uh, here this evening to give the, the COVID update. Uh, uh, so first, I, I have, I, I think, uh, good news to share. I mean, the hospitalizations are, uh, are coming down, uh, and that's, it's just so encouraging to see. Uh, I looked at the, the hospitalized uh, number today, we hadn't been at this level since the last week of October. It's taken this long for us to, to drop down. So this is, this is really good news. On the, um, the tier update, you know, we're, we remain in red, um, but you'll see that the, the case rate is coming down a bit. It's still, um, you know, it's still higher than we want, certainly than we want to see and higher than uh, most counties uh, in the state. Uh, but the, um, the test positivity is coming down as well, so we're uh, we're we're moving in the right direction. Um, the we did have a slight adjustment in, in our favor from 8.8 .8 to 8.7 because of testing. So testing is still important. I put the slide in because there is a there is a, a change on uh, where to get tested. The the uh, location that we've had at the county center three uh, yesterday was our last day there. Today. Uh, that service moved and opened uh, in series, as, as you see here. Uh, and then curative and HR support um, combined we have Modesto, Oakdale, Ceres, uh, and Turlock. So we have, we really do have good uh, access for ongoing for testing. All right, so let's talk about vaccines. So I've got a lot, I've got quite a bit on this, on this slide. Um, you, you know that uh, last week on uh, Wednesday, the, both the, uh, federal and the state um, uh, CDC and CDPH uh, approved the uh, lowering the age eligibility for the Pfizer vaccine. So now it is uh, 12 and up. That then ch it changes, you know, when we're looking at, well, how, how are we doing? What percentage are vaccinated? Well, now we have a, a population added. So, um, you know, before we were always looking at the, the, the total that could be vaccinated at 436,000. Now we're looking at 469,000. Um, so partially vaccinated, um, we have uh, almost 67,000 individuals and about 159,000 that are fully vaccinated. And it shows us at 48.1% um, of our population, of our eligible population with at least one dose. That doesn't look as good as it looked last week, but that's because you know we've added to the to the eligible population. So I just wanted to point that out. We we really aren't worse. It's it's just the just that change. I uh, show you where how we're doing on uh, vaccination by city, and of course we you know we look at this data to help uh, drive our efforts to uh, to increase vaccination and uh, by race and ethnicity. And again, it, it shows where we have, uh, we have more, uh, more work to do, more effort um, with certain populations, uh, more so than, than others. 
uh, and then we look at uh, look at it by the Healthy Places Index quartile. Um, the one being the the least opportunity to be healthy, and uh, we're doing a little better in two. Uh, you might recall that the, the quartile three only has one zip code in our in our community, so really one and two is our is our population. And this shows you the trend. Uh, you know, we were really uh, those that were really pursuing the the vaccine. Uh, I think have had access and. Uh, have been able to get it, and now we're, uh, we're we've seen that we've seen that decline and uh, more work to do. Um, I added uh, the the uh, uh, vaccine volumes for last week. This is just the public health, just our our clinics. Um, and although that doesn't, if you just look at the total administered, it doesn't look too good. Um, I would point out that the the uh, the first dose and the single dose that would represent those that are newly seeking the vaccine. It is a, a decent percentage increase over the week before. So maybe that is pointing that our, our efforts are are working. Um, uh, this is a snapshot. This is on our website. This is a flyer that we send out to a large network uh, trying to to promote where we are where we will be. Um, uh, today we, uh, and let's see, it's, oh, we just finished. Uh, we had a, a vaccine clinic at the Riverbank Community Center. I understand it was well subscribed. We actually added more appointments because it was filling. Uh, so that was a really good sign. I understand that there, it, it appeared that, that uh, a lot of families with that 12 to 15 um, uh, age group were, uh, were there today. So I don't, I don't have numbers, of course, yet. but. Uh, and then, and then uh, tomorrow, we have a very busy day tomorrow, and you'll see we're at Waterford High School. Uh, last week, we were at Rivermank High School. You're going to see more and more schools on this schedule as, as we go forward. Um, and you might have noticed on the earlier slide, Waterford was a little behind some of the other uh, cities. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully tomorrow will we'll help to, uh, to change that. Uh, we'll, we're also, you see, we're also going to be at the Crow's Landing um, flea market both Saturday and Sunday this week. We'll be out there on Friday um, to promote it as well, uh, and, and hopefully we'll have some a good take-up rate um, this weekend. Uh, last last week when we were here, uh, Dr. Wayne Pine talked a little bit about vaccine hesitancy and shared some data um, from polling that that we'd received from the state. And I just thought I would like to update you on on some of the work that we're doing in the in the AOC. On our, on our efforts and, and kind of some just evolving strategies. Um, we, we know that, uh, that, um, that there are individuals who, uh, who, who will listen to a trusted messenger, uh, and that may vary in terms of who that is. So we're, we're kind of working, uh, working that too. Um, partnering with different sites, um, I said schools, uh, businesses, uh, we're working right now with the Modesto Nuts, and we may be doing something at at, uh, at games there. Um, Community-based organizations, and we've we've put out a survey uh, to churches. We, we've already done some some. There's already been some vaccinating done at churches, but we're trying to get a, a sense of, of where there might be more interest and where we could partner there. And then more uh, work going on with uh, with the potential for incentives. Uh, we actually uh, we have uh, we've been awarded a. A small grant from Kaiser uh, for some incentive, um, and what that's developing into is uh, perhaps working with some businesses where you get a vaccine and there's a discount to whatever that that business is. With schools, uh, we're developing a kind of a fundraiser for the school so that uh, for a dose, a dollar donated to the to the student body or to a or to a school club, hoping that that will that will generate some. Um, some interest too. So these are these are developing ideas uh, uh, at, at kind of various stages right now. Okay, and this is uh, that the the graphic is is from the the state's uh, <coughs> iTurn website. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very friendly website to get on and and uh, find find an appointment, find assistance uh, assistance if if transportation assistance is needed homebound. It's it's uh, it's I think very uh, friendly, user friendly. But if individuals have difficulty, they can call that phone number. That's the state phone number for my turn, and they'll help an individual make an appointment. Or you can call our public health line uh, as well, and we will we will assist because we want 
everyone to get vaccinated. And that's what I have for you this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one thing I want to point out, I have to commend you and your team because when we started talking about how to get to, um, you know, areas that we might not be able to reach, and I know you had one of the slides, but getting out to the uh, Crow's Landing flea market on Saturday and Sunday, uh, government is never that nimble, and you've become really nimble uh, along with your team. And please pass on my compliments because I, I think the, the churches, those ideas, I think are going to be the future for us. They're not going to be in max packs. I think we know that, but uh, we're going to have to be. And then for anyone that's homebound, because I've heard a lot of people going to myturn.ca.gov, you can get an appointment and someone will actually go out uh, to a house to do an individual vaccination. So appreciate it. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Chairman, yeah. I got one. Uh, I'd echo the same, the way you guys uh, adapt and move. It's, it's been great. And thank you for the great report. Um, going to the slide with the total doses, of the vaccines, the first, second, single doses. You have the single dose, zero, zero, zero. Are we not pushing the single dose? Are we not getting those anymore? But, uh, uh, is this, am I on the right? The right slide. That's what you were referring to with the with the partially vaccinated and the fully vaccinated. No, I have. Oh, I'm okay. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Oh, right here. Okay. Yep, where it has the single doses zero zero zero. Uh, last week was the first week that we started the single doses again. Okay. And it seemed to help a bit. You said, um, we, we gave 280 single doses. Okay. Um, so we, what we did is we, we added it to where we had second dose only, where we're, where we're uh, you know, closing down the mass fax. We went ahead and, and added the single dose too, thinking that might, that might uh, drive some folks in too. And it, and it seems, to have, seems to have worked. Okay. Are we still getting those? Are they still? Are we still putting in a request for a certain amount? Or we uh, we haven't for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we we weren't allocated any of the single dose, but we we didn't need it when the when the uh, pause went on for the single dose. I believe we had 4,100 in inventory. Oh. So and and we we still have some inventory of, of Pfizer and Moderna because we're not going through it as as quickly. So we have we have adequate inventory at, at this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll, uh, Marianne, <laughs> so thank you for all you're doing. Doing great stuff, as we always say. We're so appreciative. So I'm one of those guys that the last thing I was going to do is get a vaccine. I never got one in my life. I guess I probably had a vaccine when I was a kid, as kids. And so I got to say, I went and got my vaccine today. And I, I, I um, got it here from, um, I did the single dose, is what I did. Um, and so um, it, it, you know, it was painless, of course. It, there was no lines. There's no waiting. There's just there's just no reason not to go and get it. And I see, you know, we talk about the vaccine hesitancy, and it was great the chart I think last week we had that showed there's a percentage of the population that instantly got in line to get their vaccines, and then there's the ones that are hesitating, trying to figure out what they're going to do, and then there's the ones there's no way in heck I'm going to get my vaccine. So I would say I was probably one of there's no way. I mean, my wife got one, and that might have had something to do with making me get one. <laughs> but but I, I I just want to encourage. Everybody, it was great. I actually, I, I started to do the my turn thing, and then I called Marianne and said, "Where can I go get?" And, and she sent me right over. And I walked in in 15 minutes, and I was on a Zoom call while I was getting my vaccine. So it was perfect. It worked out. It's very, very, very um, easy to do. So I would just encourage everybody to um, to go and get their vaccine. I think the only side effect I can see, I'm starting to lose my hair oh, wow. as a result of. Or maybe that was before. I don't know. But it, anyway, it's it's painless. I encourage everybody to go and do it. And uh, if I can do it, then geez, anybody should go do it. So I lost thank you for hair. all you're doing. I lost my hair too. We, 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 <laughs> so thank you, Marianne, for all you're doing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Seeing nothing else, we'll move on to the public comment periods. An opportunity to speak on anything that is not on today's posted agenda. Please keep your comments to five minutes or less. I do have speaker cards, but you can come up. You don't have to have a speaker card. And then before I get started, I'm going to acknowledge a, um, a public comment that I received from Edgar Garibay. 
and it was inviting the board and anyone else to envision the Tuolumne River Regional Park, Carpenter Road Park, Thursday, May 20th from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. There's another one. You're right. I'm going to go deeper in my pile. And it is from Rhonda Allen, and it's regarding the assisted outpatient treatment. So acknowledge both of those. Okay, so on to the speaker cards. The first speaker card I have is John X. Mataka. Good evening, John. Good evening. Good evening, uh, board. Uh, my name is John X. Mataka, and I'm the uh, current president of the Grayson Neighborhood Council. Uh, starting in October uh, of 2020 and ending in uh, uh, March of 2021, the Grayson Neighborhood Council conducted uh, surveys on the whole west side, all the communities on the west side of Stanislaus County. We had received a small grant to do that. And basically what the survey was, was asking folks uh, what their needs were as a result of the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic, excuse me. And uh, so tonight, here on public comment, um, we've made presentations to uh, the Newman uh, City Council, we've made presentations to the Patterson City Council. And tonight we're here uh, on public comment to briefly share some of the uh, results of those surveys for the communities of Grayson, Wesley, and Vernalis, because this board is the one that has direct uh, over, I don't know, overlooks or oversees or however you want to put it, maybe overlooks not the best word, but that has responsibility for uh, that. Not that Patterson doesn't have some, but still. So anyway, so we have several folks that are going to briefly talk about uh, certain parts of it. And then if uh, time allows, they'll share uh, their little personal part about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And in closing, I just want to say this, that uh, we will forward this report to all the board uh, by the end of the week in an email so that you'll have it. Uh, and last but not least, uh, without sharing too much about it, one of the issues that came up throughout the West Side was the need, uh, people asking about need for mental health services for children and adults as a result of the pandemic. And so I've been in communication with Ruben Imperial of uh, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, and I'm pleased to uh, say that he's been very cooperative, and uh, we have a meeting scheduled next week uh, to talk with uh, the Patterson School District about the current services that they provide in Wesley and Grayson and Patterson, uh, and uh, to uh, kind of look at what's there now and uh, where we can fill in the gaps uh, because it appears that, you know, there's some folks that either don't know about that service or uh, there's some gaps in the in the service that need to be addressed. So without further ado, I'll, uh, and if you could uh, oblige us by please calling the folks up in yes. the order that's there so it'll make more sense okay. to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yolanda Lomelli. These are the results of Grayson Wesley Bernalis COVID-19 survey. I want to mention that English is my second language, but I will try my best. 140 or 189 survey said utility assist, assist was priority number one. 139 out 189 survey said food assistant was number two priority. 126 out of 189 surveyed said rental assist was third priority. 102 out of 189 surveyed said suffered personal income reductions. 102 out of 189 are suffering economic hardship. 76 out of 189 recently lost their jobs due to COVID-19. 60 or 
or of 189 need mental, mental health services, mostly children and seniors. 46 are of 189 are in need of medical expense assistance. 42 are 189 are in need of COVID-19 text, testing accessibility. 19 or of 189 suffer loss of business income. These are not brick and mortar businesses. My name is Yolanda Lomeli. I have been living at Grayson the past, the last 30 years. I work at a child development center in Patterson as a toddler teacher. The year 2020 was a very difficult and challenging year for me and my family economically. And emotionally. At the end of the year, both my husband and I got infected with COVID-19. My symptoms were worse than his. My husband, my husband had to close his barber shop for eight months, get on unemployment. He's still struggling to build up his clientele. I was off of work for two months. We are having a difficult time recovering financially and health-wise. Since this happened, I have noticed, noticed that my health has been declining. I get easily tired, very anxious and nervous, and lower back pain. I'm seriously considering retiring at the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanda. And I do want to remind everyone, stanrentassist.com is a website that helps with uh, not only rental assistance arrears and potentially in the future uh, on a prospective basis, but also on utilities, including gas, electricity, broadband, and I'm missing one, and uh, um, utility, um, yeah, sewer and water. So, Stan Rent Assist. Next is Miriam Montoya. Áreas de preocupación, Grayson, Werling y Bernalis. De los 189 participantes, un total de 430 niños fueron, acepta fueron reportados en esos hogares. 17 reportaron un hijo en el hogar. 41 reportaron dos hijos en el hogar. 49 reportaron tres hijos en el hogar. 26 reportaron cuatro hijos en el hogar. 15 reportaron cinco hijos en el hogar. Dos reportaron seis hijos en el hogar. Uno reportó ocho hijos en el hogar. 151 adulto, adultos, 189 reportaron tener hijos en el hogar. De los 189 adultos que reportaron, 25 tienen entre 18 y 30 años de edad. 93 tienen entre 31 y 50 años de edad. 71 tienen de 50 o más años de edad. De los 189 participantes, 10 reportaron haber recibido un cheque de estímulo que recibieron que que reportaron haber recibido ayuda general y estampillas de comida. 18 reportaron haber recibido beneficios de desempleo. 13 reportaron haber, haber recibido beneficios de seguro social. O, hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Miriam Montoya. Yo pertenecí a la comunidad de Grecia por más de siete años y estoy aquí para reactar cómo a mí me afectó la pandemia del COVID-19. El COVID-19 nos afectó a mi familia y a mi negocio. En, en, en nuestra forma de vida desde abril del año pasado hasta la fecha. En primer lugar, afectó a mi familia por el hecho de que perdimos amistades, af, afectó a nuestros corazones al saber que tendríamos que mudarnos a otra ciudad, porque al mudarnos, mis hijos ya no podrían seguir asistiendo al centro comunitario de Grayson, donde regularmente ellos asistían después de escuela, donde les ayudaban a les ayudaban con sus tareas, también perdimos la vivienda donde vivíamos. Tuvimos que mudarnos con unos familiares en donde estamos cinco personas en un solo cuarto. 
porque se nos ha hecho muy difícil encontrar vivienda hasta el día de hoy. No hemos podido encontrar nada estable. En segundo lugar, afectó mi trabajo porque tenemos un pequeño negocio de par y renta, el cual fue afectado por, por pérdidas y contratos que ya teníamos en, en algún, de algunos eventos, los cuales ya, no, ya nos habían dado varios depósitos y de los cuales los clientes nos cancelaron. De ahí dependíamos de los, de los ingresos para sobrevivir. Como ya pueden imaginar el estrés, la, las preocupaciones y el no saber qué va a pasar con nosotros, nos, nos está afectando nuestra salud mental. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, Miriam. Is this Lilia Lo, uh, Lomeli Gil? Lomeli Gil, yes. I will now interpret. Thank you. These are the parking lot issues for the Grayson, Vernalis, and Wesley areas. Out of 189 surveyed, a total of 480 children were in those households. 17 reported one child in the household, 41 reported two children in the household, 49 reported three children in the household, 26 reported four children in the household, 15 reported five children in the household, two reported six children in the household, household and one reported eight children, one, eight children in the household. 151 adults out of 189 reported having children in the household. Out of the 189 adults surveyed, 25 were in the 18 to 30 year old range. 93 were in the 31 to 50 year old range. 71 were in the uh, 50 plus year old range. Out of the 189 surveyed, 10 reported receiving a stimulus check, 9 reported receiving general assistance and food stamps, 18 reported uh, receiving unemployment benefits, and 13 reported social security, receiving social security benefits. Now I'm going to translate her personal experience. It says, good afternoon, my name is Mary Montoya. I belong to the Grayson community for more than seven years, and I am here to tell you how I was affected by COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 affected my family, my business, and myself in our lifestyle since April of last year, and still to date, it's affecting us. In the first place, it affected my family because we lost our friends. It affected, um, it affected my family because um, it affected also our hearts, just knowing that we had to move to another city. Moving meant that my children could not continue going to the community center where they would regularly go after school, where they would get help with their homework. We also lost our home. We had to move in with the family, for, with family members. There are five of us, my family, living in a one room and it's been difficult finding a place to rent. To date, we still haven't been able to move out. Secondly, it affected my job. We had a small party rental business, which was um, affected because of the contracts that were lost, which we had um, of, of several already scheduled events. The renters had already given their deposits and they had to cancel. My family depended on those earnings to survive. As you can imagine, the stress, the worrying, the not knowing what's going to happen to us next has affected our mental health. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lilia. Appreciate you coming in. Next, Yolanda Gomez. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yolanda Gomez. I'm a lifelong resident of the west side of Stanislaus County. I will be talking to you today about comparisons with the west side of Stanislaus County. Um, on the west side of Stanislaus County, the top two needs were utility assistance and food assistance. In Patterson, Grayson, Wesley, and Bernalis, the third priority was rental assistance. In Newman, the third priority was economic hardship. Um, out of 617 people surveyed on the west side, 330 people reported experiencing personal income reduction. 259 people reported losing their jobs due to COVID-19 issues. 
and 1,306 children in the households, which is most likely what played a part in food assistance being one of the top two priorities. Child breakdowns are as follow for the people surveyed. There was 355 children in the Newman and Crozanding area, 521 people children in Patterson and 430 in the Grayson, Wesley, and Bernalis area for a grand total of 1,306. Um, out of the 617 people surveyed, 242 pe head of households were in the age ranges of 50 or above. Um, and as I mentioned, I have been a lifelong resident of the west side of our county. Um, 2020 was a full year of goals for myself. Um, where I planned on looking into grad school, traveling, celebrating my 15th anniversary with my husband. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the reality is that when COVID-19 hit, everything stopped. Um, I was actually infected with COVID-19 after being, um, after having an emergency surgery. Um, two weeks after my surgery, I was to return to work. I work for Stanislaus County Office of Ed, and I requested a COVID swab to be on the safe side. Um, to my surprise, I was positive, um, and my initial thoughts were my grandparents, who live across the street and are in their 80s, my husband, my eight-year-old daughter, and my parents helping me during recovery. I was needed back at work, and I was helping Lilia Lomeli with the COVID-19 surveys. My grandparents who live across the street, due to their age, depend on me and other family members for help. We are a really large family. COVID-19 affected them emotionally as my family and I stopped frequenting their home just to keep them safe. We also lost a very dear family member and we were unable to give them a proper funeral. My grandparents have expressed feeling very lonely on top of their grieving. My eight-year-old daughter cried for two days straight after finding out I was positive and feared that I was going to die. She also ended up testing positive and my husband and I decided to keep it from her for her own mental health. While teachers did an amazing job raising awareness, encouraging social distancing and hygiene during distance learning, it also created a lot of anxiety and fear as COVID was a daily topic. Food was also on my mind as my mom brain never turns off. How was I going to feed my family if I could not physically go to the store or feel well enough to cook? My husband ended up testing negative throughout this whole time and I did not want to infect him and he was also quarantining. Not many services are available to Grayson such as Instacart or other delivery services. I'm very blessed to have family nearby and services like Wi-Fi knowing how to place orders online but not many in Grayson have these services. Professionally, I maintain a caseload of 180 to 200 families with the County Office of Education, and I have daily calls from people asking for assistance, whether it's health, um, mental health, food, losing their job, housing, etc. I understand that I'm a resource to them, and I take that role very seriously. However, while I'm trying to reassure them, I'm also a person going through the same issues that they are going through. During this pandemic, I felt very defeated and incompetent in my job for the first time ever, as more and more families are reaching out for assistance and more and more resources are becoming scarce. Many families have shared that they're unsuccessful getting their needs met. After connecting with so many families affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, I've also felt immensely frustrated and guilty. All in all, COVID-19 has definitely impacted my mental health and that is an issue I work with daily. While trying to keep myself positive, there's so much negativity out there specifically related to COVID. After hearing from so many families in our community, I'm thankful for all the organizers for keeping little towns like Grayson on the map. We're very thankful for all of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. All right, next up, Deborah Harper.
Good evening. My name is Deborah Harper, and I received a an extended. I recently was. Let me rephrase that. Start real quick. I was uh, falsely suspended from the library for one day with false information. I was falsely suspended for a month. Two days later, with false information. I texted. I went up the peaceful and reasonably went up the chain of command with the accurate information in multiple texts. So I'm going to go ahead and read the letter carefully and respectfully. Dear Ms. Deborah L. Harper, your library privileges are suspended until October 30th, 2021. You are not to enter any Stanislaus County library facility or grounds until after that date. You are not to contact any Stanislaus County library facility or staff member by mail, telephone, text, fax, or email, and if you do, such actions will be considered harassment. The reasons for this suspension are as follows. On April, 21, on April 28, 2021, you were issued a one-month ban notice to end on May 28, 2021, based on an incident that occurred on April 27, 2021. As outlined in that ban notice, you were ordered not to contact library staff and that such contact would be considered harassment. After being issued the one-month library ban, you may contact with library staff via voicemail and text messages seven times on April 28, 2021, 12 times on April 29, 2021, and five times on April 30, 2021. Also on April 28, 2021, while at the Modesto Library, you telephone library administration to speak with the county librarian and have the April 20 ban notice dismissed. Your, during your conversation with the county library and you stated your belief that the library staff was to blame for the suspension and demand she apologize and dismiss the ban notice. The county librarian declined to do so and attempted to explain why. And when, she, when said, you then said she was stupid and hung up. A few minutes later, you called the county librarian directly and told her she should not talk to you, that she would sue the library and publicly humiliate and degrade her. On April 27, 2021, while at, Mod at the Modesto Library, a library customer reported you were bothering him, continuing to talk to him after he asked you to stop. When the customer reported the incident to library security, you were disruptive and yelled at security and the customer from your location in the teen area. Security asked you to lower your voice and you responded by continuing to talk loudly. Security called for the Modesto police to respond. Prior to police arrival, you walked up to security and stated you had filed a complaint against them and then walked out of the library. You returned to the Modesto Library on April 28, 2021, at which point the library security gave you the one month library bound notice they were not able to provide you the previous day. You requested to speak to a manager and requested the bandies be dismissed. While the manager was attempting to respond to your request, you repeated, repeatedly interrupted and did not allow for a response. Your voice became loud and argumentative. And when asked to speak more quietly, you refused. Modesto police were called to respond and you left prior to police arrival. On April 24th, 2021, while at Modesto Library, it was reported that you were loud and disruptive. On April 22, 2021, library security noticed that you had left the library without your jacket shortly after closing. An attempt was made to locate you to return your jacket as you were not in the area. Your jacket was placed in the lost and found. On April 24th, library security saw that you had your jacket tucked with you outside and in front of the library and confirmed that you had the jacket returned to you by janitorial staff on Thursday evening. After the conversation, security began to walk away, at which point you yelled at them to stop harassing and bothering you. You then walked into the library, following them and speaking in a loud voice. Security asked you to lower your voice. You stepped in front of other library customers and loudly stated you needed to use the restroom. Security advised you that the restrooms were in use and there were other people in line waiting and that you needed to lower the volume of your voice. You refused. After using it and upon existing, exiting the restroom, you started to talk loudly again and continued to refuse to reduce your volume as requested by security. Security asked you to leave, which you did when you then returned yelling and arguing with security. When asked by security to lower your volume and to leave, you refused and continued to complain loudly and about library staff bothering you. Because of your disruptive behavior and refusal to lower your voice, you were issued a two-day ban 
to end on April 26, 2021. You requested. May I finish? Is that okay? Wrap it up. Thank you. You requested and spoke to library supervisor on duty asking to have the ban rescinded. The request was denied. You continued to yell, left the library for about five minutes and re then returned once again yelling at security. When you refused to leave, library security called for Modesto police to respond. When Modesto police arrived, security also observed that Modesto fire and AMR ambulance were also at the front of the library. You then left the, in, with the AMR ambulance. Okay, there's more to the letter, but it's kind of like benign. That's very strong, very inaccurate. I've, I wrote the accurate as it occurred, as I was going through the ambulance, as everything was going on, and it was ignored. I attempted to talk to the CEO, Mr. Mendez, in the, in the CEO's office. He didn't respond to any calls. I'm peaceful and reasonable. This is just totally out of whack. And I've written the accurate information. This has been going on since 2006. I'm a very peaceful and reasonable person. I don't yell. I'm very, very uh, adaptive. I, I respect people. I love people. And on my, it's just, I'm going to have to uh, pursue it further. I haven't had time because I'm being spun out of control with false information throughout the community, the buses and other areas. It's a sphere of influence thing. So it's now a huge issue and it's a huge problem that I cannot I cannot be modest about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Anyone else for public comment? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I think I'm going to follow up on the issue of the survey that was done in the area of Patterson, Wesley, Grayson, and the other areas in Turlock and in Newman. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You did it in purpose, sir? I'm going to talk no. to the attorney in the county. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> Somebody calling me. <laughs> thank you. So I think, I think that proved to you that the service had not been done properly. Some were somehow the system and not the system. And not doing the job they're supposed to do. We present to you before the economic package, the first and the second, and the same problem. The many committees don't receive the, the, the money or the information and the report of how and who is giving the money and what happened to the money. And now with the survey of what the group from Mr. John Matata is doing, that show clear that we need not only that area, or the area of Mr. Candid, but we need to each of the board supervisor, geographic area, to do the same. And I hope the county, to the 1.7 million they have already, plus the supplies money of 40 under the table, can give some money to communities to do a survey and to be really asking the community what is your problem, what problem you're facing with the county and services. That is small example showing to you that the county and the system that's supposed to be around the county is not doing the job it's supposed to do. Or is not contact the people directly and not giving the information properly or giving in Spanish different type of languages or not reaching the community directly. So that Prove to you that under the District 5, the same is going to happen, District 4, District 2, District 3, District 1. So we need Mr. Chairman to ask Mr. Hayes that he have the power to manipulate the money, to ask for specific funds to do the same survey to the six, five districts, ten, or four districts. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Miguel. Anyone else for public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. We do have a conflict. Yes, I have a, I have a conflict on, geez, I have B1. item one. B1. B1. I'm sorry, D1. Uh, B1. It's, it's a client of mine that I need to step out, and so. Um, okay, so before you do that, okay. um, does any of the board member want to pull any item? Anyone want to comment on any item that's on the consent calendar? 
in the audience. Okay, seeing none, we'll do a motion minus D1. Uh, motion minus D1. Motion minus D1. We have a motion and? Second. A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Let the record show that Supervisor Withrow has left the dais. And I'll entertain a motion for D1. Motion for D1. We have a motion and? Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. There are no public hearings. Moving on to item D1, approval of the Stanislaus County System Improvement Plan, SIP, for the Child Welfare Systems of the Community Service Agency and the Probation Department. Uh, presenting will be Christine Huber, Dave Chapman, Kathy Harwell. No mark. Hey, welcome. Chairman Chiesa, members of the board, CEO Hayes, and County Council Bowes. I'm Katherine Harwell, the director of the Community Services Agency. Joining me for the presentation this evening are Christine Huber, the <coughs> assistant director of the Adult, Child, and Family Services Division for the Community Services Agency, and Dave Chapman, division director of the Juvenile Field Services for the Probation Department. Tonight we'll be pre presenting to you our Stanislaus County Systems Improvement Plan. The System Improvement Plan is a joint plan developed and implemented by both Stanislaus County Child Welfare and Probation Departments. And is a comprehensive evaluation of performance-based outcomes related to the provision of child welfare services. This plan is required by the State of California as a result of the passage of the Child Welfare Systems Improvement and Accountability Act passed in 2001 and is modeled after the Federal Child and Family Services review requirements. This process is designed to improve outcomes for children in the child welfare and probation system and to hold the county and state agencies accountable for our performance. This level of evaluation provides for a systematic assessment of our programs and our services for our, both our strengths and our limitations. The information obtained through the plan development process is utilized to improve outcomes for children and families served through our programs. The plan before you tonight covers the time frame of January 30th of 2020 through January 30th of 2025. We began the plan development with a community self-assessment in the spring of 2019. After a very lengthy and thorough process of review with the state of California and some delays at the state level, we are now here before you tonight to review the plan and to seek your support and approval. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Child Welfare Management Team and the Probation Department Management Team and all the staff involved for their work developing the plan before you tonight. Next slide. It's important to note that improving the outcomes for children and families requires support from everybody in our community. Our vision is that together we can achieve safety permanency, and well-being for children. Tonight, Christine Huber and Dave Chapman will be providing you details about the extensive efforts that were put in place to involve many community organizations, law enforcement, the courts, various county departments, parents, and foster youth in the development of this plan. At this time, I'll be turning the presentation over to Christine and Dave. Good evening. Child welfare's overarching goal is to prevent children from being abused and prevent children from entering foster care. If foster care is the only option to maintain their safety, our goal is to reunify them safely with their parents. For those children that are not able to reunify with their parents, we move to provide permanency as quickly as possible, adoption being the first priority. Who we serve? We serve approximately somewhere between 700 and 800 children in foster care at any given time. That's from the age of zero um, through the age of 21. As you can see, our family maintenance programs are, are children who are living with their parents. Um, and last year, 
um, we had 96 children that were adopted. Just for some background, the Child and Family Services Reviews is a mandated federal state collaborative effort, like Kathy mentioned, designated to help ensure that quality services are provided to children and their families. The federal government has administered these reviews since 2000. They review state child welfare programs and practices that identify strengths and challenges in state child welfare programs, focusing on outcomes for children and families in the area of safety, permanency, and well-being. California then developed a program improvement plan with specific goals they must, that must be met. The state then mirrors this evaluation process with each county. The federal government sets the national standards for all child welfare and probation agency performances and holds all states accountable for these performances through periodic audits and case reviews. California's performance should be based on the cumulative performance of each of the 58 counties. Not only are outcomes reviewed, but Stanislaus County completes detailed case reviews for 100 children per year, which identifies areas of strengths and areas we need to improve. Using our outcome data and information from these case reviews, we establish a baseline for our performance. Then we move to the self-assessment stage. Just as a brief interview, um, not interview, overview. Um, the county's self-assessment purpose is for child welfare agencies to take an in-depth look at the array of services we provide to prevent children from being abused, to safely return children to a home that is safe, preventing children from returning to foster care, and to place children in a permanent home if they are unable to return to their parents. This helps us identify any needs or areas for improvement. The self-assessment process is completed by analyzing outcome statistical information, conducting focus groups, and holding stakeholder forums to fully involve the community in the analysis of our system. Um, for peer review is next. Um, once we identify the areas of improvement, the county coordinates with the California Department of Social Services to identify an outcome to focus on for the peer review. The peer review is a process where counties conduct a systematic review of child welfare and probation cases with the assistance of child welfare and probation staff from other counties in California. Next is the system improvement plan, which ties the county self-assessment and the peer review together to create a strategic guide to improve services to families and their community. The system improvement plan specifically identifies the strategies that will be utilized with specific goals and build in timelines to monitor the county's performance. Once child welfare and juvenile probation agree upon the finished system improvement plan with the Department of Social Services, the plan is required to be reviewed by the Board of Supervisors for your approval. And then we will have quarterly data reports um, as we're required to monitor um, to provide a way to analyze our performance on an ongoing basis and provide an opportunity to make adjustments to improve our strategies. And then we have an annual system improvement plan progress report that the county updates the system improvement plan to reflect what we have accomplished and to analyze performance on the outcome goals. This is also an opportunity to explain in writing if there are any adoptions to the strategies and explain why. If you were curious about our previous system improvement strategies, um, we were a little ambitious and we had seven strategies between child welfare and probation that we accomplished in those five years. As you can see, they're mainly focused on involving families and others to support the children um, and their families and to provide the best services that we can. Um, developing more intensive family maintenance and family reunification models um, to support families and provide the level of service they need and, and for probation to strengthen engagement with parents for timely reunification. And so back at the peer review, um, in April and May, peers from seven different California counties spent three days in the count Stanislaus County meeting with social workers and probation officers regarding county child welfare and probation practices, including in-depth case file reviews and interviews and we're very thankful for them to take the time out of their busy schedule to come help us. Next, we conducted the focus groups um, where the county meets with the key participants like the children we serve, parents, 
foster parents, relative caregivers, social workers, and other county service departments. Those focus groups are conducted in English and Spanish as appropriate. We also hosted a large stakeholder community meeting on April 4th, 2019. The purpose of the stakeholder forum is to involve our community partners to assist us in a frank conversation about how well we are performing on preventing child abuse, delinquency, and protecting children through services provided to parents to safely allow their children to live with them again, providing a permanent, permanency safe home for children to live if they cannot return to their parents, and setting up community support for families so they will not need our services in the future. The feedback from the peer reviewers, focus groups, and stakeholders identified the following indicators that led to families' involvement in child welfare or probation. We have found that many families have complex needs that overlap with long-term substance abuse, poverty, and mental illness that may have taken years to develop. We also have families that completed services to get their children back and have housing assistance to pay for a home, but are unable to find a home that has a reasonable rent price. Domestic violence is also a common um, in, in many of our families that we work with. Although the system improvement plan is focused on four specific outcomes, which we'll explain next, there are nine outcomes measuring safety um, and permanency, and there are 10 more outcomes that we monitor measuring child well-being, which I will explain next. So for safety, um, we're measured on no reoccurrence of maltreatment, um, which is how many children that are found to be abused or neglected are victims of abuse and neglect within the next 12 months. No maltreatment in foster care looks at all the children in foster care in a given year and what percentage were victims of abuse or neglect by a resource parent or caregiver. Under permanency, the first three outcomes are looking at the time frames for children to find permanency, which means reunifying with their parent in guardianship or adoption. Um, Reentry um, following foster care looks at the percentage of children who do go home um, and then return to foster care within 12 months. And placement stability looks at all children who enter care in a 12 month period, which is the rate of placement moves per 1,000 days. For child well-being, um, children's placement experience is an important component of child well-being. Limiting the number of placements that a child experiences, the placement of children in a home of a relative or extended family member, and the placement of Native American children in a relative or Native American foster home are priorities well supported. Social workers and probation officers contact with children and families in the field are important to child well-being Specifically, Child Welfare Services tracks how quickly social workers make contact with families in child abuse investigations, both emergency and non-emergency, and timely contact with families. We are responsible for the health of children who are dependents of our county. All children in foster care receive regularly timely doctor and dental exams and make sure that the children who are in need of medication do so through our social workers acquiring authorization from the juvenile court. We are also responsible to ensure that the educational needs for children are met. This may include advocating for individualized education plans and tracking educational credits earned. Not all of the indicators have um, national or state standards, but three of the areas that we are successful in that have a national standard are the three you see here. Um, which is um, permanency for children in care, um, meaning that, that for those children who have been in care um, for 12 to 23 months, um, that they have either reunified with their parent, gone into guardianship, or been adopted. Um, timely um, investigations um, and timely visits with the children in foster care. So the safety and well-being of our children is a shared responsibility and stakeholder community involvement in evaluating our services and effectiveness is integral to creating our system improvement plan. 
Based on stakeholder feedback, these outcomes were identified and are focused for improvement. Through discussions with our stakeholders, we were able to develop several interventions and strategies that will increase our ability to provide a service that will keep children safe, provide them permanency, and increase their well-being. And we'll, I'll go through and explain each of these. The first strategy um, um, is to establish a visitation center. We want to integrate family finding, implement quality parenting initiative, and develop a quality assurance process that explores our policies and practices to address racial and ethnic disproportionality and disparities. So for the visitation center, improving the organization and environment of the visitation center to better support conditions for parents, resource parents, children, and social workers to strengthen engagement. Research demonstrates that family visitation, both on and off site, is linked to positive outcomes, including improved child well-being, less time in out-of-home care, and foster reunification. Consistent and frequent family time is considered best practice for dependency cases and is the single most important factor related to whether a child remains out of their home. Research also supports visitation with increasing attachment, less acting out behavior, and childhood depression. Our current visitation area is located at the community services facility, which is our office <coughs> building, and not warm and friendly that encourages building relationships and quality time for families and children. It is also not large enough space to meet the needs for those twice weekly visits that encourage bonding between parents and children. Our next goal is focused on family finding and strengthening the child support system and long-term relationships. Family finding is directly related to improved family engagement. Our goal is to use improved technology and streamline communication between the family finder units or social workers and prospective relatives. Research supports family finding and engagement reduces the number of children entering care, reduces the time in care, and also the number of changes between foster homes. This occurs by engaging, accepting and linking families, cultures, and communities as support for the child. In that way, we may not just connect relatives, but those considered important supports <coughs> to the child. Our third activity is participation in the Quality Parenting Initiative, known as QPI. QPI fits well with collaborative programs that already exist by underlying mutual respect, communication, and learning. That is matching policy to practice. QPI has shown to improve meaningful relationships, reduce child trauma, and improve positive system change, including the recruitment of skilled care providers. Placement stability is shown to improve when parents and care providers feel heard and are considered valued, informed, and active partners and participants in providing parenting and care for the child. Lastly is disproportionality and disparity. This is a broad, explorative, and qualitative research process for child welfare to recognize that Stanislaus County is committed to examining how our system impacts children from varied cultures, ethnicities, and race. This process will follow the continuum of involvement from children in our child welfare system from the very beginning of investigations through all of our <coughs> units. Um, just one example, if we were to look at our decision points of looking at children in foster care by ethnicity, and specifically look at 2020, <coughs> black children are five times as likely to be in care than white children, and Native American children are almost four times as likely to be in foster care than white children when we look at these disparity rates. Once we understand the data at these key decision points, we need to review, assure, and look to adjust, correct, and improve current processes. We will not do this work by ourselves. We will be including our stakeholders, our clients, our, and groups we have not traditionally worked with to better understand the issue and to start working towards an equitable system. And with that, I will turn it over to Dave. Great, thank you. So many of the things that Christine mentioned uh, apply to your probation youth, but I wanna put things in context for you. Um, <clears throat> Our probation youth uh, range in ages uh, 12 to 
12 to under the age of 18. And uh, I, if I see the word group home, I think then folks start thinking, oh, okay, yeah, kids in group homes have been in trouble and this is where they went. And if you go back about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, we, we did have a large number of youth on probation who had committed a number of offenses that through the process, placement or group home placement was kind of a default. Uh, and uh, that actually increased the number of youth we had in out of home placement. But <clears throat> over the last 10 years and through some of the continuum of care reform that has been enacted, um, probation departments statewide have been enacting different ways to try to work with youth on the front end to try to avoid sending kids to group homes and now they're called uh, treatment programs and they've uh, shortened the amount of time that they need to be there and added additional services and our probation department and when I was the supervisor many years ago we had over 100 kids with placement orders and we would had to visit them just as Christine mentioned we deal with their education their health we visit them on a uh, monthly basis and we had a very large team of uh, placement officers uh, today uh, we have no more than about 15 kids or 15 to 20 kids with the same orders. And that's been through a huge kind of reorganization of how we manage our youth that come through the juvenile justice system. Trying to find things to work with the families on the front end, wraparound services on the back end, trying to implement evidence-based programming with youth to try to keep them out of the system and also doing some preventative stuff I was here previously on the youth assessment in the center and uh, gave a presentation on that. So we're trying to do these things to keep kids out of, uh, out of home placement. <clears throat> that said, during this evaluation for our system improvement plan, um, we did very well in a lot of areas, a lot of strategies uh, for this time frame. but one area we didn't do so well in, uh, and shows here on the screen, we came about 10% off the national standard, was for those youth that were actually in out of home placement for a period of time of 12 to 23 months, uh, we didn't reunify, meaning bring them back home in the time frame that we would have liked to have done that. We, we definitely wanted to bring them home sooner, but let me put this in context for you too. Kids on probation who have committed some sort of delinquent act, <clears throat> or they could have previously been a, a dependent and come to us, it's really hard for them to engage in treatment in a six month, 12 month window. I mean, just by the time they're there for 12 months, we find that they've earned the trust with the people they're working with and they're developing these skills to kind of learn how to think differently and do things differently. And usually it takes an additional 12 months to get them back home with the skills they need to work in the home. Plus, when we bring them back home, we've learned you can't just bring a kid back home. You've got to provide services in the home, too, with the family to help them after the, the fact they've been in placement. So... We do really well, 23 to 20, 20 at the 23 month uh, level, but at the 12 month, we're still working really hard on that. And one of the areas we need to improve on is family finding. So, one of our strategies is try to implement a model where we try to find family members, maybe their existing mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, or maybe extended family members who want might want to take this youth into their home and work with them <coughs> to kind of help them through the process that they're while they're on probation and, and to provide those services. Now, think about that for just a second. How many families really want to take a 12 to 17 year old who has some sort of delinquent history into their home and work with them when they may have their own children or other families they have to work with? It is extremely difficult to get families, foster families to take probation youth and or other family members to engage youth that may not be theirs, but to try to take them in. But we've made it a goal over the next five years to try to improve that through education, through engaging families, and utilizing some of the services out there that are out there to bring families to help us through this process. Um, challenges facing the probation population, obviously recruiting families for foster to be foster families, retaining families. Um, they may want to do it for a few months, six months, but after they've been doing it and they went, hey, this is great, I had my nephew for about six months, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so, we, you know, engaging them not just to take their family members, but maybe another youth that may not have a family that, you know, they can act as a foster family. Um, addressing their criminogenic needs, and basically that means their risks and needs and identifying what exactly we can do to address that youth <clears throat> why they came into our system and how we can get them out as soon as possible, providing them with the skills necessary to make better decisions. And then, of course, uh, there are some uh, programs and software and different things to do to look for family members that may not be in the area, so we're going to try to engage that. And then also trying to reduce the stigma 
of what it means to be a youth that's on probation through further education uh, to our community. So with what we've just presented to the board, we have two asks. The first is to approve the county system improvement plan. And the second is to authorize the chairman of the board to sign the county system improvement plan. We thank you very much for your time today. And if you have any questions, we'll be here to ask. Answer. Thank you very much, Dave and Christine. Mm -hmm. Questions for? I just got a, a couple comments, if we could. First, Christine, Dave, and, and Kathy. Where'd Kathy go? There we go, sorry. Thank you very much um, for, for what you guys do. And I know you're, um, this is, uh, when it comes to kids, this is very difficult work. And you guys are doing the Lord's work. There's no, there's no question about it. And it's, it's easy, um, and, and last, well, last month, I think a couple meetings ago, we had, I think it was uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month. And we talked about that and, and, and how um, tragic that is and, and how it affects our whole community. And it's so easy when we go through these um, plans here, you know, we talk about our strategic plans and our goals and everything. And, and, but, but I sit here and I think, and you look at the pictures of kids, we're talking about kids, right? We're just talking about, you guys know this better than anybody, that we lose that sometimes. We lose what, you know, as we go through our strategic plans, and here's what we're going to do for the next five years, and, and here's what we did the last five years, and it's just like, but when it comes down to these little kids, what happened to them, and where are they right now, and how have they, how have they turned out? And I know we've had... Um, an increase in foster care, right? I know that, is that number still, in, sorry, Kathy, I'm gonna to look to you. Is that number still increasing? Sorry, sorry, Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, the number of children that we have in foster care has been reduced over this year. Um, but again, we're waiting to see the impacts of COVID and whether those numbers will go back up okay. over the next course of the next year. Okay, that sounds that sounds good. That's encouraging, and then also I know Dave, you're talking about. It sounds like the probation program you used to have a lot more that was in that. I don't know if that's a real indication that things are getting better, or it's just a, the way the system is treating them now. There, I, I would say it's a it's a combination of so many things. It's hard to point to one, but because we've been so proactive in trying to do least restrictive environment, engaging the family, doing services on the front end, uh, trying to provide different programming to youth to help them think differently and make different decisions and to not just right out the gate recommend sending a youth to placement where in the past that was an option that was on the table most of the time. Now it's that's the last option. So um, in meeting with uh, child welfare and doing child family team meetings and bringing people together to try to multidisciplinary uh, analyze the whole situation and then make a decision and not just make a decision, decision from the hip. So yeah, all those things together that has helped our numbers tremendously. Okay, and how do we stack up compared to other counties? You know, I know we have these, all these counties came part of this peer review team. I mean, how do, what's your guys' gut feeling? Are we making, do you feel like we're making progress? Are we not? Um, I forgot Absol all this stuff. I say absolutely. I think we've made significant progress. And I think uh, we compare up to other counties. Uh, we've done very, very well. Um, there's still a lot of things occurring in our society right now that could change things, but we're being proactive in how we move forward. So, okay. One of the things with the children's system of care reform or continuum of care reform is that we went from um, group homes to now we have short-term residential treatment programs. And so really looking at how we can focus on um, moving children from the highest level of care into coming back to be with relatives or even with their parents over time. So really looking at that stepping down of care and we're making a tremendous progress in that area. Okay, and, and, and as you guys know, as we say this all the time, it is, is all these kids who are, get into our child welfare, welfare system are probably the kids that we end up um, serving throughout our county um, for a good portion of their lives. And, and, and our tax dollars are spent on those. So again, and I just want to repeat the same thing as we had a couple of weeks ago. This is so darn important, you know, the work that we're doing here, and it will make such a difference. And I know you guys are doing everything you can. I, I would love to see how much we spend in total on our kids in this community. I would love to see throughout the departments how many of them that are touching children in this community, how many dollars we're spending, and then really um, look at the results 
you know, what, what kind of result are we getting from those dollars that we're spending? And again, this, this is kind of looking at it from a global, but we have so many departments and so many of them are, are involved, you know, just probation in itself and, and all these others that are, that are touching these children. Let's, let's find out um, the total dollar amount that we're spending and, and how many different programs. It would be great to have a report. How many programs do we have in the county? And, and how many dollars are being spent? And then, and then again, then it's back to results. How do you guys feel? Are we making progress or are we not? Where, where, where are, we, where are the, the gaps? And I know this, this is what this is kind of about. It, it's a strategic plan as to, uh, to what we're doing, but I would really love to see it, uh, something that would be a global, countywide where we stand and how much, how much we're doing. I'm gonna turn it over to Christine for a minute to talk about what's happening at the federal level right now and some focus um, into the future on prevention because really looking at how do we help build stronger families and provide the supports to them and supports to children prior to entering. Right. Our foster care system is a really important part so I'll just let her explain a little bit about what's happening at the federal level and what potentially we're looking forward to. So there was federal legislation passed a few years ago um, called Families First Prevention and Services Act. And California is in the process of developing their plans with the implementation date, due date of October 1st of 2021. And it's prevention of children entering foster care. So not child abuse prevention, but prevention of entry to foster care. And it actually will give us um, the use of federal funding that we've not been able to access ever before. Um, and it's 50% basically 50% and then match of, of state and, and local funds to draw down that dollar. And it's really focused on evidence-based <coughs> services. So research has shown that these services work and we'll be able to work with families on substance abuse in home parenting, um, mental health services and kinship services. And so we feel that we can really do a lot and focus on those families so they don't even enter foster care. And we really have worked hard, and that's where I think we've seen the biggest changes is involving families mm -hmm. and friends and whoever wants to support that child in the decision making. And while we have a lot of knowledge and expertise and things like that, we're not an expert on somebody's family. And if they can come in and support that child. And so if we can just reduce a child coming into care, their outcomes are so much better. Um, not just today, but long term. Okay. Great. Well, again, again, you guys are doing the Lord's work. We appreciate so much what you're doing. And I just I just would love for us to be able to come back and kind of look at this whole thing. And um, again, dollar-wise and results-wise across the county and all the departments. So thank you guys very much for the presentation here. Supervisor Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Christine, Dave, Kathy, thank you for the report. I was looking at one, uh, reading this, this entire report, and that's a lot of reading. Uh, P4. It talks about over 50% of the parents were former foster youth themselves, and we're talking about re-entry into the foster system. And I've heard Supervisor Withrow talk about this before, breaking that chain cycle. Uh, it's almost like we need to offer service parenting skills at some point. But it, it just, it, that, that stat just jumped out at me. That's where the prevention piece, what we're talking about, is really being able to have information out to families um, in parenting skills to our whole community so that um, as, as our parents or as our kids are growing up, they're learning about parenting. As they become parents, they have those skills. One, one of the things that we worked on is when they're working with us, because we have social workers working with them. We have all sorts of support systems and people are checking on them and, and they do great. But then everything goes away and they're on their own. And so we've created um, aftercare services and things like that through our family resource center so that they can be connected in their community and have one someone there to support them. Um, but we do find that, you know, sometimes former foster youth just don't have those support systems like maybe I do with, you know, family and friends and such. And so it can be very difficult for them as they, they, they no longer have us involved in their life and don't have maybe someone to help them. No doubt. I've leaned on my support system quite a bit. I can't imagine not having anybody else to lean on. And, and they don't want probation in their system longer than they need them to be there. So it makes it difficult for us when we, uh, the sooner we're done with them, they, the better in their percep you know, their perception of it. But really, we really want to try to provide as many services to the youth and families uh, as long as we can. 
but we do have to at some point lose jurisdiction and uh, then and hopefully after care and providing services to other from other areas of the community and partnering with other agencies for after care that's one of the other things that we need to also look at I'll put my uh, first five commissioner hat on and say that one of the goals in our first five is to look at parenting programs throughout the community and how we continue to increase that, get that education awareness out, and provide that through our family resource centers and other means. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have one question. So six areas we didn't meet the national standard. We chose three, which we think are the most important. Now, when we do peer review, are we grabbing best practices from other counties? It's because it seems like, you know, with 58 counties trying lots of things, some of them are very successful and rather than reinvent the wheel. Yeah, that's exactly how we do that. If we pick a strategy and we're weak there, we find a peer that's been very strong and have okay. them come evaluate how we've been doing it. So that's exactly how we do it. Yeah, I appreciate all your time and effort with the 143-page document. Luckily, it's not a yearly thing for sure. Uh, any other questions? All right. See you thank you very much. Oh, yep, I'll go to public comment. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what you have in your package, but I know seeing that report in regard to the racial and cultural, you never mentioned the linguistic part. And that I'm talking about that report, not in your report. In your package, there may be this be a hundred something pages. The second part is the I don't see in that report the racial numbers, how many are Mexican-American, how many are Mexican, Latinos, or African-American in regard to the children that are being served. I don't see that statistic report. And one of the biggest issues that we're facing is the homes, the location for the home for the children. It's very difficult. Number one, for the regular families and no homes, we in this county have a crisis, not only this county, but to the state. We have crisis in housing. So what is the purpose to try to implement a program when the homes in not exist? So it's, <coughs> it's really like Mr. Whitrow said, I want to see how much money we spend for child. The same can be applied for the homeless. The same can apply for senior citizens. The same apply to the workforce development, how much we spend in that person. It's millions and millions of dollars, but what is the result? What the, what the success? I don't see too much, really, to be honest with you, especially in housing. Mr. Hayes, I hope so, he have a program or prepare a plan to improve the housing condition in this county. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Miguel. Any other comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. I will make a motion to approve all staff recommendations. Second. We have a motion, and we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. On to item 9-2, acceptance of the report, uh, Stanislaus County COVID-19 response, the year review, March uh, 2020 through March 2021. Patrice, Raul, and Jody Hayes will be starting. <clears throat> All right, good evening, uh, Chairman Chiesa, members of the board, and our entire uh, public and staff for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I just wanna kick us off as we're bringing this uh, uh, presentation up to speed here. Uh, we did task our entire county team with developing a report at the one year mark for COVID-19. And obviously we've been very, very busy um, trying to work particularly on our vaccination plan and distribution. So it took us a little while to get that, that one year mark uh, uh, prepared and available for the public. But we do bring that for you uh, this evening. Uh, we felt it was important for us uh, to capture some of the journey over this last year, um, to document that, uh, to document some of our lessons learned, um, but to have at least a summary document of um, what each one of our county departments have joined in, in terms of our COVID-19 emergency response. So this was our best effort to try to do it quickly. I will tell you that I, I asked our team to make sure that they captured 
some of the most important statistics and areas that they worked in. It does not mean they've captured every single thing that occurred over this last year, um, but I was pleased uh, at their balance between um, brevity and detail here. Um, I want to also thank all of the county department heads for supporting their staff and their work through this entire process, as well as the chief executive office team. Um, I particularly want to thank uh, Ms. Amy Carroll, who's here driving the presentation tonight. Uh, she uh, was instrumental in making sure that we got all of this um, put into writing and pretty enough for us to be able to distribute and even print a few copies that might be available at some point as well. Uh, I will tell you that a year from now, we'll most likely be doing year number two and we'll do a report um, to capture what um, we really should have some, some definitive look back documents over time so that when individuals want to know what happened in 2020 and 2021, they won't have to look far to get a good summary, executive summary over the last year. I've asked uh, Assistant Executive Officers uh, Patrice Dietrich and Raul Mendez to present the um, uh, item tonight. Um, they're just gonna go through very quickly and highlight some of the department sections. Um, I know a lot of department heads worked on this, but we thought with 26 <coughs> different departments, I would just ask Patrice and I, who normally don't present on the COVID matters, but are always working behind the scenes with us to have a little face time here to discuss it. So Patrice, Raul, it's all yours. Okay, so we're going to kick off in the area of community health. And as we look back over this last year, um, I don't think any of us envisioned that we would be um, spending an entire year addressing um, this emergency. Um, as you know, the county quickly focused our resources and concentrated efforts on protecting our residents through a multifaceted approach, um, mostly in reliance on local partnerships, active engagement through public information channels, and multiple mitigation strategies. The focus on community health was at the forefront of our COVID response. Uh, data metrics for the year March 2020 through March 2021 are displayed on the screen. They're pretty small, but they are highlighted nicely in the actual report. Over 540,000 tests reported in our county during this time, 2,384 hospitalizations, 132,390 doses of vaccine, um, and as you've heard throughout the series of um, weekly COVID reports at the board meetings, um, multiple vaccine clinics, multiple testing sites, um, and those vaccine clinics also moving to uh, mobile efforts and um, targeting various areas of need in the community as well as essential worker um, pools. So this has been um, a, a project of, of working together. Some uh, key accomplishments, implementation of telehealth and outpatient clinics and in mental health treatment and counseling during this past year, expanded use of technologies to communicate with the public through texting and automated messaging, um, fully established testing service for surveillance and mitigation strategies, procurement of PPE. A year ago, did we even know what that was? Personal protective equipment for first responders, all county staff and the community. Um, also of note, uh, within our Area Agency on Aging, a change in senior meals moving to a weekly box meal, which um, took a program that was accustomed to serving 350 seniors each week to 1,534 seniors being served. Very significant. Um, and then as well, in our um, behavioral health and recovery services and community services agencies where we have um, outreach workers, right, who go out and um, assist in um, mental health outreach in the uh, adult protective services and child protective services areas. In those teams, um, they're needed to continue to be contact with individuals in need um, where possible through video visitation where allowable, but also in um, limited home and field visits where frankly required for safety. A lot of virtual supports, caregiver sections. Um, and then finally, many individuals and organizations contributed supplies and materials to assist in the COVID response throughout the county. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so in the area of housing, um, Community Services Agency is the lead for emergency care and shelter and working through the um, EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, and with teams of people throughout the county and um, literally throughout the county. Um, they were successfully able to support um, services for populations including COVID-19 positive, about 334 people who did not require hospitalization but did need isolation or quarantine, 
about 4,800 individuals with documented exposure who needed isolation. Um, you know what, that's 4,800 households with almost 12,000 people. And then the third population, those who are at risk, asymptomatic, but at high risk and requiring emergency non-congregate shelter. So um, truly this was stepping up to do services we've never done before. Um, CSA contracted with the Modesto Hotel. It was staffed with county employees 24-7. Um, from April of uh, the prior year through February of 2021. And then most recently, in partnership with the City of Modesto and Stanislaw Regional Housing Authority, the county has launched the Emergency Rental Assistance Program to assist eligible households um, unable to pay rent and utility arrears that were accrued during the pandemic. And I know um, Supervisor Key has mentioned this earlier as a program that continues to be available. Um, the, the amount of funds is actually going to be increased in its availability. And then within the area of our neighborhoods and keeping um, the community safe, we'll start um, with the Sheriff's Office and their um, support of the emergency, maintaining public safety throughout the entire pandemic response and, and ongoing. Um, the department reconfigured their staffing strategies to be able to respond to the multiple needs of the public, uh, implemented the countywide emergency operations plan, um, limited and contained a COVID-19 outbreak among inmates in November of 2020, and then a second in January of this year, and actually did a really good job in responding quickly to those things. Um, they managed to hold the emergency operations team together in an organized fashion for the, uh, the longest emergency activation in county history. Um, and then a couple quick uh, notes of um, new services and new ways of approaching our work um, between the DA, district attorney, the courts, and our public defender. Uh, they implemented widespread video arraignments and electronic record processes to help reduce the need to have staff appear in the courthouse. Uh, the probation department um, stepped into the role of handling releases from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, um, primarily due to um, issues with space in um, those state facilities um, and probation handled 74 early releases in the month of July 2020 alone. A uh, quick shout out to the Stanislaw Animal Services Agency for their um, emergency foster program and the fact that they emptied the shelter, 400 pets left and um, went to, to new homes and 80% of them were subsequently adopted by those foster families. And then finally, um, the elections office was able to conduct the mandated all-male election, which was a first for our county um, and a whole new way of doing business. And they processed more than 217,000 vote by mail ballots. So um, that is a quick recap of those areas. And now I'm going to pass it to Raul to finish the report. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrice. And uh, now I will cover some of our work uh, to support our local economy and also in the area of uh, educational outreach. The local economy has been impacted by COVID-19, including federal and state policies and directives related to shelter in place and business closures. The county organization has been able to weather the COVID impact as sales tax receipts have positively, positively rebounded after the initial month of closure, along with, along with how online sales have benefited the county pool. For many in our community, recovery will take much longer. Our Workforce Development Department was immediately responsive to the pandemic and established a COVID-19 information and resource website for grants, loans for businesses, and or job seekers. The Business Resource Center was established to assist the Emergency Operations Center with business calls and support, and staff and navigators help with grant applications. Finally, a call center was established to assist with layoff, unemployment insurance questions, and more. In total, Workforce Development distributed $20.4 million in grant funds to 1,166 small businesses in Stanislaus County and $171,000 to 563 dislocated workers. In addition, the county also allocated $15 million of CARES CRF funding to the incorporated cities to assist in their pandemic response, including uh, with the purchase of PPE equipment, uh, first responder support, and implementing smaller scale business grant programs. Additional community support included $2.9 million to our community-based organizations, 
to support the community service agency and public health with wraparound services, outreach, and education efforts. $2 million was also invested in the downtown or the Modesto Downtown Partnership uh, to establish and implement the Stan Radcard program countywide, a program that benefited small businesses and community residents alike who participated. An additional $2.4 million was allocated to support the nonprofit support grant programs benefiting 61 organizations providing services in the area of arts and culture and youth to the community. This was done through a partnership with the Stanislaus Community Foundation. Executive Order Number 01-20 permitted treasurer tax collectors to consider the economic hardship when waiving property tax penalties. Our treasurer tax collector received approximately 500 penalty waivers uh, requests and only 51 were denied for not meeting the criteria. And in spite of all the impacts and remote working, the collection rate has maintained above 95%. Community outreach was a top priority for all county departments during the first year of this emergency. Outreach efforts targeted toward children and families was some of the most important work for the first five Stanislaus, which distributed diapers, wipes, PPE, and more to essential workers serving the zero to five community through a partnership with the Stanislaus County Office of Education. Unfortunately, our libraries were closed to the public for a time Many, many library staff were reallocated to COVID-19 relief support roles. And the department adapted and continued to serve through virtual story times, bilingual story times, grab and go STEM kits, online book groups, and, trivia night, and Friday night trivia, circulation on cloud library and e-book -plat e platforms increased by 75% during this last year. The county stood up a COVID-19 call center in partnership with 211, a program of the United Way of San Jose County. This occurred last spring. The call center received over 35,000 calls and over 6,400 emails from the period of March 31st, 2020 through March 2021. The communication team at the EOC coordinated the production of 40,000 COVID kits with face coverings hand sanitizers, and public health information in partnership with our Love Our Neighbors volunteer recruitment efforts. In addition, it coordinated access to 18,000 additional face coverings from the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. These COVID kits and face coverings were distributed by the Latino COVID Coalition and provided to uh, residents in underserved areas of the community. Coordinated the communications team also coordinated the distribution of PPE to several community-based organizations. This included 180,000 hand sanitizers, face coverings, and disinfective supplies. Communication during this last year has been key. Critical public health information for vaccinations, COVID-19 testing sites, and transmission data was shared broadly and was inclusive of the Latino community. Outreach included work with the local media to increase awareness, including all regional newspapers, radio stations, magazines, and promoted content on the county's website and social media channels. Digital message boards, bus ads, and billboards were also used. Outre outreach workers also handed out information, hand sanitizer, and face coverings in public venues. Leveraging the ScanAware opt-in text notification system to keep residents informed was also something that was done. Four million text alerts were sent in the first year of the pandemic. Through the Stan Emergency Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram platforms, the county reached over 45,000 unique followers regularly. 109 content-rich videos were also produced with critical public health information throughout this past year. The YouTube channel had 54,000 or over 54,000 total channel views in this time. And, we went, and when we discover new ways to reach our community through Facebook Live, hosting 16 live broadcasts with subject matter experts from our community who shared information and answered questions from concerned uh, residents. The report this evening details uh, the most significant impacts of COVID-19 
and the county's response to the public health pandemic. As mentioned earlier, it is not all inclusive and cannot document all the efforts and all the staff day in, all the, I'm sorry, and cannot document all of the efforts of all our staff day in and day out to transition and adapt to continue to serve the community during this past year. The team has worked diligently to balance the health and safety of the entire county with the need for people to work and for local businesses to remain viable. We remain positive that the county has persevered and will emerge stronger through the many lessons learned and with the strengthened partnerships. We will continue to work to stabilize community health and safety along with health, uh, mental health support and safety net services. We want the community to know that the report is viewable on the homepage of our website at stancounty.com. Hard copies will also be available, as mentioned earlier, uh, on the sixth floor uh, as of tomorrow if, anybody, if anyone would like to receive a hard copy. Finally, finally, we ask that the Board of Supervisors approve and accept the Stanislaus County COVID-19 report year in review. All of our staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Perfect. Any questions of staff? Comments? Please, just a couple comments here. Um, first, um, Patrice and Raul, Amy, thank you guys for doing this. And, and I, I know that we've had people come in here over the last year, if not once, several times, or articles in the B that, that ask, what's the county doing? You know, what are we doing with the, with the COVID-19? You know, we're not doing anything. What are you guys doing? And I think the better question is, what aren't we doing um, with regard to COVID-19? This is great. We've tried to summarize as best we could, and I appreciate that, just all the efforts that the county has made to try to deal with. And, and, and as we always say, you know, we're making this up as we go along. How many of you here have dealt with a pandemic lately? I mean, you know, when was the last pandemic you dealt with? And so unbelievable the efforts that has been put forth by all of the staff here at the county and, and the CEO's office. We appreciate everything everybody's done. We had last week um, an agenda item also because this just talks about all the efforts, but we didn't get a chance to get to it last week, but it, it was on consent, but it dealt with dollar amounts, you know, money that we have spent. And we had such a packed calendar last week that I know we couldn't we, we, we put that one on consent for everyone to see, but, but just, I'd just like to point out just a couple of, you know, of the dollars that we spent. In addition, this points out what we've done and a little bit of the money that we've put back in the community. As we know, we had $108 million in between the federal and state that we started with here, and, and now we have more that we're going to talk about here later. But just a little bit, just to go through, we, um, we had $15 million that we gave to all the cities, uh, our nine cities that we allocated between our cities, $18.4 in business grants that we gave to businesses, $18.4 million that we distributed um, throughout the county um, to try to support businesses, $5.3 million to help support nonprofit organizations. We had $2 million in the STANRAD program, which you, which you mentioned there. Um, we had 550000 to administration of grants throughout the county to help help with those. We had 500,000 to fire districts. I see we have a lot of uh, fire people here today and we welcome them all here. Um, but there was 500,000 that we gave out to fire districts um, uh, and another 46 million that we just spent you know, within the county in trying to cover the cost of us doing everything that we just talked about here on, you know, on, our, on this presentation. So like I said, it's not what are we doing, it's what haven't we done. And, and again, we're not perfect, we know that. We, again, we're making this up as we go, but I can't say it has been from lack of effort from, from this board and, and, and more importantly from the employees of Stanislaus County and what they've done and the effort that they've put, on, put in to, to try to support this community. In addition to while still doing all of the other things that we do every day for the community members of this county. You know, it's not only, we didn't shut everything else down and just go, okay, let's go all COVID and, and shut the rest of, the, of our services down. We did everything else at the same time. So I'm very proud, I know everybody up here is very proud of all of you and, and I'm looking at staff and what you've done and community members who have stepped up um, during, this, um, during this pandemic. And I very much appreciate this report tonight just to, to try to point some of that out. Not that we're patting ourselves on the back. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's plenty more we should have done. It's never enough, I get it. But, uh, but I am very proud of what you guys have, have put together and, and done in this last year. So thank you very much. Other comments? 
Supervisor Grable. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, this, this is a great presentation, but I don't think it does justice to everything that was done behind the scenes. Uh, I appreciate it being very succinct and kind of to the point. But when the pandemic, when I got on the board, the, we were still in the thick of the pandemic and how innovative staff was, uh, you know, dealing with the unprecedented pandemic, just like Supervisor Withrow said that nobody was ready for this. But what I appreciated was thinking outside of the box. Uh, when vaccinations became available, how we all worked together with community partners, uh, with different departments, uh, whether it was CSA dropping off water bottles uh, at a vaccination clinic or, or it was the outreach team uh, constantly updating the public about where vaccinations are available. That's where I really got to see it when I came on the board is I think a couple months right after getting uh, on the board is when the vaccinations came into full force. But that was the part that really uh, showed what happened behind the scenes to me. I mean, the pandemic was going prior to that in eight months. I kind of saw it from the periphery at being on the council. So um, I just want to you know, commend staff. And this presentation is more for public consumption to know everything we did in the past year. But we've seen it every day, and we appreciate it and really appreciate you guys uh, thinking outside of the box and um, working towards a goal of uh, trying to get us behind this pandemic and hopefully we're going to be there soon and a lot of that uh, success happened because of you. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Any comments from folks? Yeah. Public comment? Come on up. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the report. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to mention is, is that you know, in the survey that we did on the, on the whole west side, um, as was mentioned earlier tonight, uh, the number one or number two priority was food assistance uh, for the whole west side, which was kind of surprising to me. Uh, but it just underscored uh, that people in, in the west side were depending on uh, food banks and uh, commodities uh, it, during the time of COVID in particular due to loss of job, et cetera, illness, what have you. So I guess my comment is, I understand that uh, we had two grounds of business grants, with our, and uh, I understand that $2 million was spent on the RAD program, where if I spend $100 at a business, the county will pay for another $100 and match the funds. So I guess my, my point is, is that it would have been nice, considering what we know about the need for food assistance for people, because not everybody uh, can get food stamps and what have you. Uh, it would have been nice if there was some kind of incorporated in that RAD program uh, uh, at Food Max or Patterson Food Center, where it was actually a grocery store uh, where people could actually get food that would last them for a week versus one trip to the restaurant. And I understand businesses need support, but uh, I, I think that money could be very well spent an actual uh, uh, grocery store, like a, a, a way of getting people access to more food. That's number one. Uh, the other, uh, uh, just give me a second here. I have a little gap here. Uh, well, I'll, for now, uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just leave it at that. But oh, I know what it was. The actual facts. This is something that, that, that I'm really interested in. I appreciate all the work that everybody's done but I'd like to know, uh, like Mr. Withdraw, he's an accountant, I believe, and he's a numbers man. And I'm not, I'm not I don't want to say I'm a numbers man, but I would, I would really like to know uh, for different communities uh, the, the dollar amounts that were spent to businesses throughout the West Side, as an example, Patterson, Grayson, West, like that. The dollar amount that was spent, uh, has been spent up to date on rental assistance, utility assistance in the various communities. I think that's important as a member of the community to know that it's, it's, it's great to know that $10 million has been spent overall in the county, but as a community member, I want to know how much of that has been spent in my community and where, and where that money was spent. And I think that, that I have a right to know that. So I would at some point like to uh, request that there be a breakdown 
in, in those areas of funding that, that the county has made to a community level, uh, Patterson community, uh, Newman community, Grayson Wesley community, so that we actually know uh, how much of that money was spent in those different areas in, in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, John. Uh, uh, Mr. Pataka, if I could just uh, add a couple of thoughts. Thank you very much for your comments. You bring forward a, um, a very good point about trying to enlist uh, grocery stores to assist at the route card. We actually still have availability in the unincorporated area to expand that program. So I'll ask our team to get a hold of you to work directly with you and maybe we can coordinate some of those efforts. It's not too late for us to do more of that work. So thank you for that idea. I would also like to add that uh, for individuals um, on the western side of Stanislaus County, we do have a number of family resource centers that we've been funding to um, try to fill the gap wherever we can. Doesn't uh, provide every single thing every person needs, but we are present in, um, I believe, Newman, Patterson, and Grayson. I think the Grayson location is at the elementary school there. Um, I should also add that our emergency rental assistance program uh, that provides help with utilities, rent, and so forth, They've had a mobile site out there for at least maybe six to eight weeks in Grayson as well. Um, so I would expect that when we do run these reports by community and we can show you that data, I think it's a very um, reasonable request. Um, I would expect a strong showing or a proportionate showing at least from those communities. Thank you. And can I just real quick, John, very much appreciate your comments. But the, the, when we talk about the RAD program and the restaurants, it's not just to keep the restaurants, to help the restaurants. It's, it's to help the restaurants have employees so those employees can then get paid and then they can buy food. You know, so there's that aspect of it too that, that you know, it works its way through. It wasn't just, oh, let's just help the restaurant owner. Well, let's help the restaurant continue to employ people who then won't um, need, become dependent on, on just food handouts. So you know, that, that was just the concept behind it. But I appreciate your thoughts and, and, and you know, I'm sure we can grab more data for you on that. Thank you. One more pitch for StanRentAssist.com. Very important. There is still money available for that program at the 100% in arrears. Uh, that's the county's uh, money, and then the state money is not paying it 100%. But I've heard that there was money in, uh, well, I think it was through the American Rescue Plan that's coming through the state where the state will pay 100%. But I, I don't think that's in the current program. But uh, so make sure and tell all your friends, <coughs> utilities, uh, broadband or uh, internet, garbage, water, sewer, it just won't pay your telephone bill and yell it out, Tina. <laughs> it won't pay your telephone bill and what are the two things it doesn't pay? Well, that's pretty much it. Not pay okay, that's it. So just your telephone. So please remember that. Okay, back to this item. <laughs> I'm sorry. I keep saying that because I want all that money used because more is coming. Uh, thank you. I think this sounded much like the state of the county address. We're talking about some of these things are extraordinary efforts by uh, in an extraordinary event. Uh, people delivering meals. I, I see Margie out there. Uh, the things your your department has done are pretty amazing. The animal shelter just. And it's the volunteers, because again, we get paid as county employees. I think we've done a great job, uh, but we get paid to do that job. And some of these volunteers that have shown up, it's just unbelievable. And I heard my senior is serving meals for United Samaritan that really help out uh, folks. So again, thank you very much for this update. I'm sorry, there are no more comments. I'm gonna move on to the next item, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on to item nine, three, Oh, vote. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Huh. I'm sorry. Accept it. Yes. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> I will uh, entertain a motion to accept the report. Make the motion to accept the report. We have a motion. I'll second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you again. <clears throat> On to item 9 3 consideration of strategic priorities of the use of $107 million of the American Rescue Plan Act better known as ARPA funding allocated to Stanislaus County and its related actions. Uh, Angelica Ramos will be helping the assistant CEO, Raul Mendez, and CEO Hayes. We're gonna give it just a minute to uh, get our PC set up. 
and we do need to make a quick little change in that presentation before it goes up on the screen. I do know that. And uh, Supervisor Graywell is going to be right back out. So we'll give it just a minute. Thank you. Stretch break. Mm -hmm. And regarding the rent, uh, can I ask for my ex wife to have rent to pay? No? So if you want to come up and say that again, I'll respond, Miguel. I do want to acknowledge the last two items. We had not received any public comment uh, by email. That's correct. It will be December 25th on my last meeting when I finally remember to say that. Okay, thank you everyone for sticking in for a long night at the Board of Supervisors meeting. So once again, Chairman Kiesa, members of the board, uh, we're here to present um, this uh, initial consideration of our strategic priorities for the use of what amounts to approximately $107 million in the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. And you're gonna hear a lot about ARPA over the next couple of years. Um, and that funding allocation to Stanislaus County. So for tonight, I just want to set the, the, the stage for everyone and say, these are some of the initial strategies. Um, they're not set in stone tonight. It's our attempt to come to the board and say, these are the areas that we think we need to work on. Here are some specific partnerships that we think could deliver some uh, pretty quick improvements here in Stanislaus County in a number of key critical areas, uh, particularly areas of disadvantaged communities. Um, and for our board to provide us feedback on that. Um, we will then be coming back in the future on any of these specific items um, to actually finish out what recommendations would need to take place for us to fund anything. So we're not uh, coming on the first day looking for a specific funding authority. Um, we're looking for strategic alignment here, thoughts of the Board of Supervisors, and also an opportunity for the public to weigh in on your impression or thoughts that um, you have for these initial strategic priorities that we're going to lay out mm -hmm. as county staff. We have a number of staff who are involved in key leadership roles that are supporting this effort, so I'm going to ask them to come up and join the presentation at specific times. And we also have a couple of community partners that I really appreciate you sticking with us uh, this evening, and we're going to invite you to come up and speak to um, the um, different programs that you're associated with as well and answer any questions of the Board of Supervisors ultimately. I would like, to, if we could, um, reserve questions till we get through each one of the initiatives until we get through to staff recommendations and then open up questions to all the issues. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Deputy Executive Officer Angelica Ramos. Angelica has the key responsibility of keeping all of our ARPA funds on track and keeping all of us organized. And I really appreciate that. She did a great job with our CARES Act funding, continues to do that here with the new one, ARPA. So it's all yours, Angelica. Thank you, Jody. Uh, good evening, members of the board, CEO Hayes and County Council both. So we are here today uh, to bring forward some strategic priorities for your consideration on this next round of stimulus funding that's coming to our county. Um, uh, in the amount of $107 million. Um, so just to manage expectations, I've got 23 slides and a group of people that will be supporting what's here and will kind of rotate in and take us through the presentation. So by way of background, um, this funding comes to us through the American Rescue Plan, um, which was signed into law by President Biden on March 11th, 2021 and in total is much larger, uh, is a much larger uh, stimulus package at $1.9 trillion. Um, within that ARPA legislation, there is a portion uh, referred to as the State and Local Coronavirus Fiscal Relief, Fiscal Recovery Fund. Uh, this is where we are receiving our $170 million from. That legislation includes in part $65.1 billion in direct funding, uh, flex, in the direct flex, flexible aid to every county in America, another $65.1 billion for metropolitan cities and non-entitlement jurisdictions, our cities of Modesto and Turlock are included in the metropolitan cities 
um, and our other seven cities are part of those non-entitlement jurisdictions, as well as $195.3 billion uh, for all U.S. states. California is receiving $27 billion, as some of you or all of you may have heard um, in the latest governor's budget. So funding objectives, these are the U.S. Treasury funding objectives um, set uh, for, for these funds, and these are to support the urgent COVID-19 response efforts, as well as to replace uh, lost public sector revenue, to support immediate economic stabilization and address systemic public health and economic challenges. So a little bit about the U.S. Treasury eligible uses of the funds. These are to support public health response, um, these COVID-19 mitigation efforts, um, medical behavioral health care, costs of public health and safety staff, um, as, where, as well as to replace public se sector revenue loss, um, specifically to the extent of reduction where revenue um, caused an experience um, in lower uh, governmental service delivery water and sewer infrastructure um, to make investments to improve access to clean water and invest in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure um, to address ne negative economic impacts uh, these are to respond to harms uh, occurred to workers families small businesses um, impacted industries and the public sector as a result of the emergency uh, for the consideration of premium pay for essential workers um, additional support for those who bear the greatest um, health risk because of service in critical infrastructure sectors, um, as well as for broadband infrastructure uh, to provide unserved and underserved locations with new or expanded broadband access, which has been um, very important during this pandemic as so many um, work from home and had to um, endure the distance learning um, and so on. Um, one thing to note, uh, very recently, last week, the Treasury released, um, we're calling it draft guidance, it's more like an interim um, interpretation um, of the law. We anticipate that like the CARES Act, we will continue to receive clarification of that guidance. Um, if you recall, in the CARES Act, we initially received a two to three page document from Treasury explaining what the eligible uses were of the funds and then throughout, um, through, for months after and, and, and ongoing, they established a um, questions and answers or frequently asked questions site that continued to explain um, and uh, set, set more clarity for, for how the funds could be used. We expect the same kind of trickle information to continue to come from the ARPA funds. Um, so just wanted everyone to know that. Um, so a little bit about the uh, plan for funds distribution. Again, every county is eligible to receive a direct allocation. Uh, municipalities and counties, uh, per the original legislation, are to receive the funds in two tranches. 50% um, is to be received within 60 days of the original legislation, and then the other 50% was to be received within a year. Um, of, the origin, of, of the receipt of that first payment. But very recently, we received information in which uh, we've learned that the Treasury is considering some unemployment information uh, by states in order to determine whether we are eligible for a one-time, for a payment all at once. Um, and preliminarily, the state of California does appear as of May 10th to qualify for that initial entire payment. Um, it's not clear whether counties are included in that, but that's information that continues to be clarified um, for us. But that was a little bit different than the original legislation. For our cities, our nine county cities, it's estimated that they will receive a combined 86.3 to 90, $98.1 million based on um, initial schedules. Um, of that, our city of Modesto will be receiving uh, 45.9 million and Turlock will be receiving 15.8 million and they are included in those metropolitan cities. We of course have been allocated 106, 107 uh, million dollars. These funds can be used uh, 
up to up through December 31st of 2024 and in recognition that there are projects that will start and be ongoing in our multi-year to complete. Um, projects are expected to, uh, the expectation is that projects would be completed by December 31st of 2026. So quite a bit more long-term um, as compared to our CARES Act funding, which we received and was uh, good for expenditure for about um, 18 to 20 months. Um, this is more, uh, this is a little longer than three and a half years for expenditure. So today before you, we have um, some initial funding priorities uh, as proposed uh, for our county for your consideration. And these include um, setting aside funds to support families in need as a result of the pandemic, to make an investment into community infrastructure, um, to set some money aside for a community development corporation, and to set funds aside for economic growth and job creation. And so with that, we're going to uh, talk to you a little bit more about our first initiative. And uh, to kick us off there will be Patrice Dutrick. Thank you, Angelica. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as we find ourselves um, evaluating strategies for the ARPA funds, um, a year plus into the pandemic, we're in a really different place um, in the county than we were when we received the CRF funds. And so um, we have now an unprecedented opportunity to make a difference in the community and to build up supports for residents who need safety net services. Um, we know social inequities have prevented some residents from taking advantage of program services that exist pre-COVID and that the pandemic has exacerbated those difficulties for individuals and families who are already struggling with self-sufficiency and basic life needs. I think we heard some of that information um, throughout this evening. Um, and given the multitude of safety net programs that we do have already in place in the county, augmented with federal and state relief funds, uh, staff have uh, evaluated the information. Um, we've connected with the department heads of the uh, community health priority area, and we're recommending that uh, we focus on services to assist individuals and families in accessing the array of services and funding supports rather than adding additional programs at this time. So um, to that end, we recommend investing $5 million over a period of three and a half years, um, pretty much July 2021 through December of 2024, in neighborhood-based services that at this point we envision would be provided by community-based organizations um, or family resource centers with a focus on specifically on navigation, so that if an individual um, I, or a family identifies that they have a need, that they've been impacted by COVID and they, they have needs and they're not able to um, find those services on their own, that they would have a place to go um, in their neighborhood um, utilizing the Family Resource Center network in order to uh, be able to be matched up and to navigate to the services and programs that exist um, as well. We're also um, looking at capacity building in order to support the community-based organizations who have suffered from loss of income as well due to fundraising, et cetera. Um, we, have, we have always valued the partnerships with community organizations in this county, and I think never more so than during this pandemic have we realized um, it really is a net. It's almost a web that is the safety net in the community, and, and we need them. So. Um, with that, uh, just to share a little bit more, um, in, in discussions with the uh, department heads in the community health priority, we did identify gaps in service and needs. Um, we're hoping to build upon the Family Resource Center model um, that we initiated um, during the um, preliminary this last year of COVID, um, but with a change in services, as I said, to really focus on um, navigation and capacity building. Um, we had five sites that we worked with. Um, Erica and Nacio did a quick reach out to those five sites last week um, on Friday to say, hey, we're going to be bouncing this strategy out there um, and we'll be talking with you later. Um, we also plan to uh, look at other community-based organizations and service needs. Um, some of those other needs came up this evening, um, but we do uh, anticipate looking in the array of neighborhoods. Um, so with that, our next steps are to um, work with the community services agency who has graciously agreed to be the lead county department to um, 
facilitate the contracts and the administration. They, they have existing relationships with family resource centers. And they have a fabulous contracting unit um, who knows how to pull these things together really well. Um, Erica Anasio from our office and myself will be connecting with CSA and their team. We'll be working with the um, various partners um, and over the next few weeks looking to develop that scope of work to build in outcomes and um, the right financial plan to support those strategies for the multiple years that we're envisioning. Um, we have learned a lot of lessons in the last year about um, our contracting and the support uh, being provided in the neighborhoods. And um, as well, I think I, I do just want to say that the concept on capacity building came about through the survey that the Stanislaw Community Foundation did of what were the community-based um, organization needs. So we did uh, research that information as well. Um, and we'll take all of that into account, um, develop contracts, return to the board with a recommended final program design and the related supporting contracts. So that's that idea. And now I'll pass it on to Raul for the next area. Uh, th thank you, Patrice. We are recommending a significant investment in community infrastructure, uh, the amount of $50 million. Over time, San Jose County, as the board and the community is aware, has been trying to work on uh, addressing infrastructure needs in our communities, uh, specifically within our, our unincorporated developed uh, neighborhoods uh, with limited sources of funds. Uh, as we have background uh, for, for the board and the public, back on August 23rd, 2011, the Board of Supervisors took several actions intended to guide this work and support the annexation of these unincorporated pocket areas to incorporated cities where feasible for residential neighborhood infrastructure projects, utilizing redevelopment and community development funds at that time. Uh, the board uh, action placed priority on those public health and safety, on those with public health and safety needs, uh, specifically um, the projects that were, um, those that had, had the priority were um, sewer projects uh, and then uh, storm drain projects as well. Uh, the top priority was on the sewer projects. During its uh, 2011 action, the board also adopted a resolution supporting the annexation of an incorporated, unincorporated county residential pockets within the adopted spheres of influence. Um, the greatest impediments to such annexations uh, is providing municipal infrastructure that is consistent with city standards that would uh, incentivize cities to annex these areas. Infrastructure costs for curbs, gutters, sidewalks, streets, sewer, storm drain, lighting can be significant and hence a deterrent for, for annexation proceedings. Uh, such infrastructure improvements are, are really costly and uh, without an adequate funding source, um, hard to make progress in this area. In 2019, uh, the county began identifying its urban pockets and also developing cost estimates for infrastructure improvements. Uh, these urban pockets are located in all five supervisorial districts, but predominantly in and around Modesto, Turlock, Ceres, and Riverbank. A preliminary analysis that was conducted of these pocket areas examined and revealed a total of 7,641 total parcels with significant infrastructure needs. $450 million was the estimated cost associated with uh, needed infrastructure improvements that would raise these areas to city standards, make them good candidates for annexations. Empire was included uh, as part of this 2019 urban pocket assessment and actually, actually led the way for further analysis. So in 2020, a companion analysis was conducted of 13 county communities identified there on the screen, uh, the Calvin Track, the town of Crow's Landing, Del Rio, Denair, East Oakdale, Grayson, Hickman, Keys, Knights Ferry, Monterey Park, Salida Valley, Home, and Wesley. A preliminary analysis revealed a total of 9,453 total parcels encompassing these county communities uh, with infrastructure needs uh, that were significant in terms of cost. $178 million was the estimated cost associated with uh, needed infrastructure improvements in these, in these areas. 
if investment in this area is approved and supported, uh, county staff has identified uh, these next steps and would like to return back uh, at a future date for further discussion and consideration. Uh, county staff is planning to refine its assessment. Obviously, we, we would like to bring those estimates current to today's dollars. It will also be important to develop a framework uh, for the prioritization of these areas, considering factors such as associated costs, likelihood of annexation, disadvantaged community status, leveraging of outside sources, potential, et cetera. It will also be important that we align any effort going forward with prior county uh, board uh, priorities and, and policies. County staff will also like to engage residents and community stakeholders in this process uh, through public outreach to ensure that the framework is sound. A significant investment of ARPA funds of approximately $50 million could help move the needle in Stanislaus County, for Stanislaus County in this area. I'd like now to introduce uh, Tina Rocha, who will take um, the next initiative for or strategy for consideration. Good evening. I put my glasses on so I can see. Okay, so our next um, strategy for investment is a community development corporation. Wanted to provide a little background on that um, and how, how did we get to this as one of the strategies. So in 2018, the Stanislaus Community Foundation had commissioned a study to review workforce, wage, and business data to better understand the economic ecosystem of Stanislaus County. Um, some of those findings were um, a great majority of nonprofits within the county are dedicated to social services. Minority owned businesses are, had been largely disconnected from these services and were struggling to gain culturally relevant assistance. That there were no business incubators or accelerators in the community. And that pathways to home and business ownership for low to moderate income residents were limited. The highest priorities are access to affordable home ownership and small business development. And so out of that, it was identified that there was two unique organizations that were missing from our landscape. The first one's called a Community Development Corporation, and the second one is called a Community Development Financial Institution. Lots of words and acronyms here. So. So the first one, a Community Development Corporation, or we'll hear the CDC, which is not um, the health organization, um, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It provides support um, to revitalize communities, especially those that are impoverished or struggling. And there's a very strong focus on affordable housing development, with the potential to also support education, job training, health care, commercial development, and then other social programs. The second piece that was missing is called a Community Development Financial Institution, or a CDFI. That's a private financial institution dedicated to delivering responsible and affordable lending to low income, low wealth, and other disadvantaged people and communities to help them join the economic mainstream. This would also help spark job growth and retention in hard to serve markets by financing community businesses including small businesses, micro enterprises, nonprofit organizations, commercial real estate, and again, affordable housing. So locally, we have two credit unions that are going through the process to be um, recognized as CDFIs. First one is Valley First Credit Union, and the second one is Rolling F. And um, it's expected that that will be completed in this year. So um, as a result of the Stanislaus Community Foundation study in 2018, um, they approached a uh, city ministry network. Um, they appeared to be what they proven an intermediary between um, underserved communities, the residents, and then community leadership, that they would be the ideal candidate to um, explore and begin the incubation process for a local CDC. So City Ministry work, uh, Network did agree to do that. And in 2020, they approached the South Modesto Partnership um, as um, wanting to incubate them to become the CDC. 
In late 2020, um, the board of the um, South Modesto Partnership did vote to um, begin that transition into a CDC, and all the board members stepped down except the board president and one member stayed on to help um, navigate that process. And then um, in December, that work began with City Ministry Network, the South Modesto Partnership, and the California Community Economic Development Association uh, was serving guidance to help them navigate that process. Um, in June of this year, um, City Ministry Network would be ending that incubation period for that. And then starting on July 1st, what had been formerly known as the South Modesto Partnership would now be emerging as the Stanislaus Equity Partners, um, STEP for short, and that would be the local CDC for our community. So, um, so there is local benefit here, and as we mentioned earlier, two of the things that emerged from the study was, first of all, pathway to home ownership. So having this local CDC would allow for some very innovative housing projects to occur, um, collaborating with local housing partners to facilitate the development of some innovative housing and working with, between the private sector and also government. They would be able, the CDC could also partner with the local CDFIs and other local financial institutions to help create products and services for that low to moderate income population. Um, connecting low-income families to capital and financial products to help purchase affordable homes and which would then help them accumulate wealth. And then it would also be there to provide technical and administrative support. The second core initiative area would be small business development. Um, that would provide business services, again, to the underserved communities. And it would also um, assist with some micro enterprise development and support and invest in low to moderate income entrepreneurialism as a pathway to self sufficiency. So uh, the $5 million investment is, um, would be broken up into two categories. One million was being uh, recommended for operational support for the local CDC. Um, you can see that it would start out with about a half a million for year one, um, decrease down to 350,000 in year two, and then by year three, they're almost self-sufficient, only needing approximately 125,000 for operational support, and by year four, they would be fully um, self-sustaining. Uh, self and I will say that these were conservative estimates, and so it is highly likely that the CDC would actually be um, self-sustaining um, before year four. Um, the, the CDC um, has a substantial number of existing partnerships in the community. Um, they have seven dedicated staff members with extensive experience, and they've also identified a 16-member <coughs> uh, board of directors to oversee um, this new CDC. Um, the additional funds, the $4 million, would be an investment in for development support, and this would be used for capital to help um, fund some of the innovative housing projects. Um, some of those would include supporting the development of housing units on underutilized private and public properties, providing navigation assistance um, for individuals wanting to construct accessory dwelling units, and then also partnering with the CDFIs to develop loan products and services to support low-income families. Um, it would also allow um, deeper um, outside investment into the community that we have an experience, so we can tap into um, philanthropic dollars and other resources that we just haven't had coming into our community before this. So on the next steps, um, if, if the board supported this strategy, staff would engage in discussions with other private and public partners um, to see if there was additional support out there for this effort. And then we could also negotiate an agreement with Stanislaus Equity Partners to memorialize the terms of the county's $5 million investment. Um, so I would at this time like to introduce and bring up a couple individuals that have been um, central to this effort. Um, Mr. Joe Duran, he would be the Executive Director and Chief Financial Officer of Stanislaus Equity Partners, and also Jessica Philbrun, who is the Director of Resource Development. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tina. Um, well, good evening. 
supervisors, it's uh, really a privilege to stand before you and, and be given the opportunity to try to facilitate a project that we feel that we'd really be able to be a benefit to the community. I cannot help but be moved by all of the activity already that's happened today, from volunteerism to individuals that are suffering on, on the fringes, what's happening in, in, on the west side. Um, and I, I do believe that the combination of the Commun Community Development Finance Institution with a uh, CDC that we see, that we envision, that we have a shot at really making a big difference. So thank you, you for your consideration of this project. Thank you, Chairman Chiesa. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors, as well as Mr. Hayes and Mr. Bose. Um, I just want to say my name is Jessica Filbrin, Director of Resource Development. I do appreciate um, that we have uh, been able to have extensive discussions about this, so I, I know that um, the Board is doing due diligence and um, just appreciate that as well as the opportunity for the investment and I'm um, here to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both very much. Wanted to make sure we did introductions uh, for the board and for the public as well. And we're going to go ahead and um, move on to our next topic, uh, which I will cover, and that is uh, economic growth and job creation. And so our team um, spent a lot of time uh, trying to determine which categories of community response um, uh, would be the best investment of these ARPA funds. And we kept coming back to having to have a strong showing um, for some initiative to support economic <coughs> development activities in Stanislaus County. Um, but particularly, the, the concept of economic development has many purposes and many different definitions and so forth. So we had to further define ourselves on what were we trying to accomplish? What would we be hoping to move the needle on, as Raul said earlier, on infrastructure? And for us, uh, that kept coming back to a basic question. So what does it take for our community to secure a high-performing economy? And I think we can describe a high-performing con economy. It's one that outperforms the others around you. You know, you can't outrun a recession, but you can outperform your conditions when you do it right. Um, we also want to enhance the future quality of life for all residents of Stanislaus County. I'll repeat that, for all residents of Stanislaus County. That's very, very important. This isn't just about our existing business um, segments in Stanislaus County and what we can do to grow existing businesses. I certainly hope we can. This is about bringing life to new components of the economy that maybe do not exist here, but should exist here. This is about diversifying our economy so that if, God forbid, we ever deal with another pandemic in the future, um, we can go through that situation better. Um, and then we can be stronger together. This is about building an economy that reflects the multicultural fabric of our community, our strength, our main strength. So that's the challenge that we put forward to ourselves. And we had a couple of simple answers to that. Number one is you have to have universal alignment of our vision and purpose. And a few months ago, or I'm sorry, a few years ago, um, I had the opportunity to look at one document that combined all the economic development strategies for all nine cities and the county of Stanislaus into one document. And when you read that document cover to cover, you realized quickly that we're not all on the same page. We're not all on the same page with where our strengths are today. We're not all on the same page with where our greatest opportunities for tomorrow are. So we have to get there. We have to align vision and purpose. We have to have some specific strategies that people own and that you have to be accountable to moving them forward. It's one thing to facilitate meetings and to put together a plan and say we're going to do these 10 things. It's another thing to have individuals, groups own those plans and be accountable to the community, to be accountable to what we are starting to call a community congress. You know large groups of community members that come together to monitor our progress, report out on our results, be honest with ourselves. Are we making progress on our promises or are we falling short? It's really, really important to have these measurable types of outcomes and to have clear deliverables. 
It's also important that this be a strong public and private partnership. There is no such thing as a government-driven economic development plan. That fails before it goes anywhere. This has to be the entire community working together. So you have to pull together all sectors of the community. We're fortunate here in Stanislaus County that for many years this board has supported an effort we call Focus on Prevention that lays the groundwork for what do you do when you need to pull together the 10 major sectors of the community to have difficult conversations and try to work on solutions. So that is one of our little superpowers that we've been developing over the years here in Stanislaus County is we can come together and have difficult conversations and work towards solving challenges, even when we have differences of opinion. You know, I want to acknowledge, though, that there are many other examples of the type of effort what we're talking about here in other communities. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're not going to be entirely unique in this. It will be different. I've looked at many of them. We reported them in our staff report here. So if you have a chance to take a look at that, we have the web addresses. Encourage the board or members of the public, go investigate what other communities have done here. You'll see some things you like and some things that maybe you wouldn't think make total sense here in Stanislaus County. So we're tracking that as well. But it, you know, you don't have to look far between Fresno, Kern, the Inland Empire, others, particularly inland regions of the state of California, they've gotten ahead of us in this regard. So it's time for us to play catch up for sure. I also want to acknowledge that this is, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, this is an unprecedented era of funding availability. We're here talking about one component of the American Rescue Plan tonight. This is just one component. I think Supervisor Key, as I mentioned earlier, there's more money coming for emergency rental assistance programming. That's another component of ARPA. It's not even included in the funds we're talking about here. There are many other additional funding opportunities. And what you learn quickly, whether it's the mega infrastructure project that's coming out of the uh, Biden administration or any of these other programs that have already been um, approved through the American Rescue Plan is those communities that align themselves and have clear and specific strategies of where we can make a difference in our community, they will be rewarded. And we've already seen it. So we are in a bit of a catch-up game here. We do feel like we need to move quickly. Um, we feel like we need to get this effort moving very, very fast if, in fact, this is what uh, we would like to support in our community. I also want to acknowledge that these initial conversations have been convened by the Stanislaus Community Foundation. That's been kind of a theme tonight. I think I noticed several of our initiatives, a lot of good work done through the Community Foundation, but they did pull together quite a few folks in a room to ask some of these questions that we've been talking about. And um, amongst all the different um, sectors that were represented in those conversations, um, there was universal interest in getting this moving. So there is a lot of community support for this. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about that um, uh, in just a moment. Um, our part in terms of the county, we want to recognize that the county can't lead and do everything on our own. This is a shared responsibility. This is a shared lift. So we are requesting the board consider tonight, not for formal approval, but for a concept and for you to provide us feedback on uh, an investment of up to a half a million dollars, uh, 500000 into this effort. Um, that uh, would go a long way towards supporting a consulting engagement um, that would actually deliver this product in very short order. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a very heavy lift of a lot of resources um, to try to deliver this type of a product sometime in what we would say the next six to nine months. Uh, once we have this type of a product completed, we would then be able to revisit it and think about uh, which investments make the most sense for the county, particularly, to make um, some investments in. And, you know, not all of the initiatives that will come out of here would probably be suitable for county funding. Some of them may benefit private corporations and so forth. I don't think that's where the majority of it's going, but there may be some that are specific to a specific industry and so forth. And I think it'll be pretty clear that those wouldn't be appropriate for a government investment in private organizations. However, we will be looking to that entire list. Most communities who go through this wind up with a short list of 15 to 20 specific initiatives that need care and feeding. They need some funding. 
they need sometimes just a moderate amount of grant funding to make a big difference in what they can do in the community. Those will be the types of things that we're looking for and that ultimately would be the outcome of this $500,000 initial investment so that our board could consider future investments that you know are tied to a specific overall strategy that has the support of the entire community and has measurable outcomes contemplated for the future. So with that, just like the last effort, uh, we're not alone in this. I do want to invite uh, Marianne Cannon, President and Chief Executive Officer for the Stanislaus County Community Foundation, uh, to come up and speak about the overall effort here, as well as some of the community support she's already heard uh, would want to come alongside us here. So, Thank you. Welcome, Thank you, CEO Hayes, Supervisors. Um, it's way past my bedtime, so I'll keep this brief, but really appreciate the support you're considering giving this initiative tonight. Um, Jody really laid it out well. I think if we're going to move our economy forward, even before the pandemic, we began to ask ourselves a series of questions around how do we build on our current economy, especially our ag economy, to move forward in the future, to have tradable industry, to have quality jobs, to have a diverse uh, 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 economy, if you will. And we know that communities that have really answered that question, they have their catchers mitt up in the air right now. They are catching more and more money. They are poised. They have an answer to every question. And I'm going to use Fresno as an example. Uh, Fresno right now, uh, just in the May revise for the, for the governor, secured $30 million for their Ag Food Tech Corridor uh, partnership with UC Merced. They came out of their initiative that's going to be very similar to what we're doing. So I think as, as uh, CEO Hayes said, this is about creating a portfolio of investable projects and priorities that begin to move our economy forward, to transform our economy and build an economy of the future, but still taking into consideration what currently exists. We may say we have all the naturally occurring assets to become the hydrology capital of the world. We're going to revolutionize the tech around water and water usage. What types of job training programs would we need? What would Stan State and NJC need to do in terms of creating stackable certificates? How would we create a robust uh, ecosystem of venture capital funding to support tech firms that might be interested in that? Those are the kinds of questions we're going to ask ourselves and much more. And at the end of the day, those priorities will be in three areas potentially, human capital, workforce development, economic development, and community development, which includes broadband and built environment and all the investments needed to, to bolster that infrastructure. So we're really excited. We're ready to partner with you. We have raised $175,000 from local business leaders to include with the funding from the county. Uh, we've begun to think about uh, consultative allies that could really provide us the data and analysis and trends that we need to know in order to create a, comp uh, a competitive economy that, that competes on a global scale. And so, you know, I think the communities that are poised to prosper, as CEO Hayes said, uh, they no longer have resistance to capital flow. And I'm just going to say it that way. I think communities that are historically disinvested don't know how to capture large sums of money and then deploy them. We have to create the conditions necessary in our community to deploy large amounts of money. And we were thinking about that in 2019, and we're now in a position, there's a window of opportunity that's opened in the next few years. And I think we are poised with our trusted relationships, with our history of innovative thinking, to become a community that moves from being historically disinvested to being a community that is um, highly investable, has a number of, we, ha we will have an answer to every question. And it'll all tie together. That's our goal. That's our North Star. Really excited to be in this work with the CEO's team, with all of you. Uh, with business leaders, the, the ingredients are co-led by the business sector along with government and civic leaders, um, data-driven, really understanding what the global marketplace and what data and trends are, are showing us. And it is going to be a sprint. This is going to be a fast process uh, because, again, it's a, it's a window that's opened up. So again, excited. I just want to point out we did get funding from Oak Valley Community Bank. I want to thank them. Beard Industrial, the Porges family, a lot of local business leaders have stepped up to the plate to meet you in partnership around this initiative. So I just wanted to acknowledge them. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. If you could stick around for questions, we would appreciate that as well. We're just about ready to wrap up. So in conclusion, um, uh, we've acknowledged we have some unprecedented opportunities before us today. We're looking for impacts that are gonna directly impact the quality of life for individuals in Stanislaus County for the future. 
Uh, I also want to acknowledge that the strategies that we've identified here would earmark about 90 million of our 170 million. That does leave some reserve funds there. Um, we felt it was uh, important um, to not be too precise in trying to use all 107 million and allow some flexibility of this board should other initiatives come forward or should you choose to expand any of the initiatives that we've talked about here today. Um, and we will obviously have lots of opportunity for future discussion on that as well. We have three staff recommendations before you today. Uh, one is to consider our strategic priorities and how to designate these funds going forward. Um, second is to authorize uh, myself um, to sign the treasury acceptance and award terms. I have to sign a piece of paper that's attached to this uh, board <coughs> item uh, that will allow us to receive the funds. It's always nice for the treasurer to confirm that those monies have transferred in via wire transfer, so we need that authority. And then the next is, you know, we felt it was important to, to know um, what the board's pleasure or direction was related to uh, this Community Development Corporation. So we are requesting that uh, you direct us to negotiate this agreement um, or a memorandum of understanding with Stanislaus Equity Partners <coughs> to memorialize the terms and conditions upon which we would invest funds to support um, this Community Development Corporation as discussed this evening. So with that said, we would open it up for questions of the board, our entire teams here, and then hopefully we get to hear from the public as well. Supervisor Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and CEO Hayes, thank you so much for this to your staff. You guys have done a wonderful job with this presentation. I just have a, a quick statement in regards to the $50 million that will be uh, dedicated to our infrastructure needs for unincorporated areas. This is something I'm very passionate about. I know I share that passion with my colleagues, but this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to finally make a dent in uh, getting our up-incorporated areas up to par and I look forward to uh, that investment by the county, and I, I think it's going to do uh, great service to our underserved residents. Um, I, I would like to ask a question in regards to the, the rest of the programs, and, and I, I know I represent a portion of Modesto in my district. I represent South Modesto. Uh, but how do we keep, um, I guess, the funding from being so Modesto-centric? And um, that would be my question in moving forward. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. I, I think each the answer lies in each one of those initiatives. You really have to look at um, uh, baking into the value system into the process to ensure that uh, there's um, you know a fairly and, and reasonably equal distribution of the funding throughout the entire community. Um, we've certainly heard tonight, um, uh, and we always appreciate. Um, uh, different districts stepping forward to remind us of what the issues are within their particular district. Um, but uh, I, I will tell you when, when us as staff, when we're having these conversations, we're sensitive to the broad distribution of it. But I think the answer really does lie in each of the particular initiatives, particularly when we get to that infrastructure initiative and we're looking at you know $50 million, we have to identify a process upon which you're going to evaluate all of those different areas that deserve investment. They all deserve it. So how do you develop a process? There will be an intentional um, uh, a part of that that tries to equally distribute roughly because it's never going to be perfect, but to roughly distribute those funds to the community. Wonderful. Well, this is a great step forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation to everybody that made the presentation and uh, the Community Foundation for providing their input. Uh, so I truly believe, uh, you know, this is a public-private partnership when it comes to economic development and it is unprecedented getting that type of resources into a community. But I think the punchline is uh, government can't lead it. Government can be a partner and hence the, the initial partnership of putting in some funds to get the ball rolling. Uh, so that, that's very important and very encouraging. I don't recall in recent memory that type of investment being made here in Stanislaus County. Uh, and I say Stanislaus County because I'm uh, confident and uh, uh, am, am looking forward that all the money that is spent is helping out everybody in Stanislaus County. <clears throat> but the part that I wanted to touch upon and again, always for public consumption. It's not like we're making this decision of spending $90 million without many, many briefings of many, many hours of research uh, and data provided by staff for my colleagues and I to 
even have this conversation and to look to make a decision. So uh, it was an easy decision and uh, there was a lot of uh, updates provided on how this money would be spent. So I never like to think that we just made this decision uh, in the context of this presentation. Uh, the one that um, <clears throat> is uh, something of uh, significance for me is the CDC, the Community Development Corporation. I just wanted to highlight and talk about the timeline and the time that it goes in to creating one of these uh, community de development corporations. As you can see, this was a conversation that was started almost three years ago. So there were some questions that I had heard about why a certain CDC or why are we um, not putting this out for uh, uh, other conversations. But we were open to that conversation and continue to be open to that conversation. But in this, um, in this aspect, you can see that this was something that had a lot of uh, wheels already, uh, for lack of a better term, the wheels were already turning on this. And as, as, as it was uh, shared in this presentation, but not only by staff, but other community members, the timing is of the essence. Uh, it's not like we have a huge window. We have a window, and we need to um, be expeditious and uh, effective. Uh, in getting those dollars back to our community. So we have to hit the ground running. And, and you know, that, that's what I see. And initially, even the startup uh, operational cost, when we got the presentation a couple, three weeks ago, I think it was uh, 1.5 million. So I appreciate uh, uh, it even being, being brought down. So more of the money is spent, not in only operational expenses, but in the investment. Because that's what truly is going to give us that investment and multiply it, the initial investment we put in. So um, I did want to point that out because I did have some community members reach out to me and ask those questions uh, about the CDC. But I'm confident that uh, where we are right now and how expeditious it, it, it is becoming and how much necessary it is to be expeditious, that this would put us in a position to really start grasping at those dollars that are coming down very quickly into the community. So. Thank you again for the presentation, as always, very thorough. Again, very, a lot of briefings, a lot of conversations were had beforehand. And thank you to the community partners that stayed with us till 10 o'clock at night to get their point across. Always appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other questions. So I'm going to go out to the public. First speaker card I have is Miguel Donoso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have three issues. One is the in regard to the $107 million. Already mentioned Mr. Mendes of the Empire area, so I hope so the Mr. Candid continue to push for that town that's so much needed in our community. And let me tell you something historical. In 2006, was a suit against the county for not giving infra infrastructure to the whole community. Was done by the attorney for community in San Francisco in the CLA. So this is not coming from the county. It was a suit against the county. So don't tell me that we are doing perfect job and we are so nice. No, it was a suit because you guys never did nothing for the not incorporated area. Nothing for years. So it was a suit. So let me bring you back to the second point. The second point is, like Mr. Candy said, Mr. Chad Candy, the money that is constantly coming to the county is for Modesto. Constantly coming to Modesto, Modesto, Modesto. What happened to the rest of the Stanislaus County economic development? programs. We have already a report that we bring it to you guys that show that the economic package, the number one and number two, not was completed for the whole county. The concentration was <coughs> Modesto and second was Turla. So don't come and tell me that you're going to, now we're going to give it to every county. It not look like way. Let me take and say, what how can we do it to only Modesto? Right now, you're going to approve, because I know you're going to approve, even if we're talking about the number three issue in regard to the $5 million. You're going to approve that, because you guys 98% approve it. 
never questioning Mr. Hayes. You everything is like rubber stamp, puck. Thank you, Mr. and thank you, everybody. The issue here is if it's federal money in state and local money, what happened to the notification of funding ability? It's a NOFA, supposed to be NOFA. You cannot do that. You guys are already working with the community foundation and other groups to do the funding. So that means that only this group is going to receive the fund $5 million. It's not for every part of the county, not every agency, not every organization. So it's a manipulation or monopoly in one group. And that group is Modesto. So again, you're not really sharing the whole path of money. We need in this county to be honest with you openly. We need in this county a racial agni city commission. That commission can start studying and do report from the staff and professional how it's equal the funds are being placed to every county, every seat of the board supervisor, not only for concentration in Modesto <coughs> or Turlac. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> so that means the economic development and groups that have been developed it's mostly, thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a good water, it's a <laughs> dangerous water. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I missed her case, I had to think twice. <laughs> thank you, my friend. So I think the, the issue behind that is legally, we're going to ask to the HUD Foundation, the HUD Department, and the Treasury Department, the questioning of how that money is going to be chaired to this group, whoever is the group, and asking, is possible the notification of funding ability, it was open to all the county, and not only one group from 2018. That's not right, Mr. Hayes. That's not right what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Paul Rivera. Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Rivera. I'm the chairman of the board out of Oakdale Fire Protection District. Um, I'm going to try and make this as fast as possible for you guys. I know it's running late. I'm here to speak on the consideration of the strategic plan, priorities of the use of the $107 million American Rescue Plan Act, funding allocated to the Stanislaus County, and related actions. A review of the agenda, item 9.3 for today's board of supervisors meeting presents an opportunity for the board of supervisors to allocate a portion of those funds to the fire protection district for utilization to face another extremely dangerous and high fire severity zone season. It is suggested that the funds could be utilized for fire suppression infrastructure. This is a political issue, but it is respectfully suggested that the lack of constant capital funds being available to the district because of constraints of property tax allocation and the demands placed on the district during the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown provided the beginning of the present, um, presentation to the board for a district-wide allocation. Um, pretty much, excuse me here, I got like six different texts going on from the chief. Um, it always seems like priority went towards the sheriff's department but I have to say that safety is safety, even when it comes to firemen and women and the people and structures that they protect. And then it's time that we get recognized. Um, my district alone, we have two people on one engine company and we are in charge of oh, just about 266 square miles. Um, that's a lot of coverage for two people to cover. And unfortunately, that's all we can afford. There's cutbacks and there's cutbacks and we've cut all that we can We've uh, formed a really nice relationship with the city of Modesto. It seemed to work thus far, but uh, myself and some of these other districts really could use some consideration. So thank you. And if there's anything I can do to help, please reach out. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Next speaker, Edgar Garibay. Good evening. Uh, 
board. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just, just be very brief and just as you're looking at the community infrastructure, I could just cite the example that we had in the airport neighborhood and it was about five or six years worth of work with a lot of data and so I, I, I appreciate that fact that we have to look at shovel ready projects but we really have to look at the metrics and I would recommend that in the work that we've done within the communities obviously you'd be working with those specific communities like Grayson or whomever that might be the, uh, the Grayson Neighborhood Alliance or, or these different groups that you look at that and don't come in necessarily saying I know you're not promising I'm just saying be be aware of those conversations because they are expensive and annexation, annexation does take a lot of money and so what you want to do is look at all those projects look at the different metrics of what or how do you implement equity across all supervisorial districts what are I guess you could say what's going to be the biggest bang for your buck in other words can you couple it with different more um, state and federal funding so that you can get more uh, equity implemented. So the example that I, that I could say is the active transportation project that we did in the airport neighborhood that's going to provide sidewalks uh, and connecting the different community parks. It's a $7 million project that was $4.9 million from the state and about 2 or $3 million from Stancog, I think through Measure L. So if there's ways to couple those kinds of fundings, I would just, just, just a recommendation and then working within community for the amount of years that we've been working. And obviously we have other people here that have worked broadly in these communities that we really look at that aspect and, and what can be at reach. So uh, with those kinds, because obviously you put together about give or take about maybe an $800 million dent and it's only 50 million. So we have about, you know, that's about an eighth uh, in terms of when you look at the distribution, I think you, I mean, you still have to come back with more realistic funds, but I'm just saying, looking at those things, really looking at that, and um, I'm willing to sit down if you need to have more conversations uh, about that. And I think, again, I think equity really needs to be looked at and what metrics you can look at, whether it's Cal and Virus Screen or the need in these definite in all these communities so that we can get uh, people walking and really connect, really having a regional bicycle and pedestrian network and people not having to have difficulties while they walk to school to and from every day. Some of the things that we did, uh, just to highlight, is that we did a lot of safe routes to parks, safe routes to school, and developed um, action plans within the community. So you can couple possibly that with some of the community development, uh, the community capacity building efforts, and that really brings down at that level with community data and that speaks to that because it's community driven and that's what the state and federal uh, projects are looking for, which you probably already know. So just a couple of things to consider in those two things. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Anyone else? Come on up, John. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, I support the firemen that are here. You know, until you've lived in a rural community and you have to depend on volunteer fire people and, and, and live and have to cover uh, uh, hundreds of miles, uh, I, I really feel for, for the situation that they're in. Um, you know, I remember when the sheriff uh, uh, on the west side uh, used to have to go, his whole area went from um, all the way in um, Newman all the way to uh, Knight's Ferry one officer doing that and that's what that reminds me of what that gentleman from the fire department just said so with that being said i just want to say a couple of things real quick equity um, <clears throat> how that investment is done uh, infrastructure wise is key uh, uh, what's the word i want to use um, transparency that's the word i'm looking at transparency is key to know where that money's being spent. I'll, I'll use an example. Uh, you know, we've been talking about infrastructure. It's way overdue in these islands in Modesto. I'd be the first to agree. That's way overdue. South Modesto, Crow's Landing, all these areas, way overdue. But we also have uh, infrastructure needs in the unincorporated areas, which you mentioned in the, in the uh, presentation. Wesley is an example with the water in Wesley that every three months they get a paper from the state talking about how bad the water is and, you know, all the chemicals that are in it. And uh, 
the school there in, uh, in Wesley has to uh, have, bring their own water because they can't drink the water from the things. So unincorporated areas have infrastructure needs as well. We just want transparency and equity. The other issue, and this is it for me, is, is that, you know, I and several other members of the community have some questions about interfaith, uh, not interfaith, um, what do you call them? Uh, the, the one that you're proposing to be the city, uh, city. Yeah, city ministries, about city ministries. We asked to be a part of that discussion uh, oh, a couple months ago, and uh, I forget the lady's name was Doris, was supposed to get back to us uh, and, and, and invite us, get us into the meeting, because it seemed like those meetings weren't very transparent and that, that you couldn't get into the meeting. So we asked to be, we still haven't been invited to the meeting. Uh, I don't know any work that's being done by city ministries on the west side of um, uh, where I live and the whole west side. Uh, again, it's a Modesto thing, and there's a big concern that, uh, you know, Modesto is going to be the focus of all, all their work and, you know, uh, the heck with the rest of, of, of the county. So that's an issue. We want transparency. We want to know who the 16 uh, members are on, that, uh, on their uh, board of directors. That, that should be, uh, Miguel called today and asked, and he was first told that he couldn't get that information, and then he was called back and told he could talk to Joe Duran, and that was all, the only one that they would give, uh, the name that they would only give was Joe Duran's. That's not okay. That's not a way you build trust throughout the community. Be open, be transparent, tell us who the 16 members are on there, let us observe, see how they're doing, make sure that everything is going right. Thank you. Thanks, John. CEO Hayes. Yeah, if I could just uh, clarify in terms of the board of directors for Stanislaus Equity Partners, uh, we did receive a call today requesting that information. Uh, the answer was, it's not our information to provide, it's not our organization. So you were asking about the board of directors for another organization. So what we did was we tried to put you in touch with that other organization, and the response was, no, thank you. So the information is available. All you need to do is ask the gentleman who's right there in the middle of the room. He'll provide you the information. Thank you. Well, I understand that, but when you're going to use taxpayers' money from that organization, I don't know why you couldn't provide that information. Come up here. This is just, just quickly, quickly. Uh, like Mr. Jamataka is saying, and I believe it strongly, you're already negotiating, doing negotiation for 18 months. And then you have a staff doing the negotiation. Even Mr. Hayes is part of that. Maybe Mr. Widrow is part of that, of that negotiation because he worked before with Mr. Duran and whoever the member. I don't care who is in there. That's not the issue. The issue is the transparency that you have to have into uh, uh, employees said to me, no, you need to call Mr. Duran. No, that's not the answer. Because if you're working in that project, if you want to use funds from federal or state funds, it's your job to say to us, who are these members? Because we were invited, we not were invited. And I'm not talking like Mr. Whitrow said one time, there's two groups, it's the old guard for these Latinos and the new guard. That's not the issue. The issue is the transparency from this board and from you, Mr. Hayes, they constantly cover and working only with one group. That's not right. We're talking about the whole county. I don't care who are the members. I'm talking the equity and resources to the whole county, not only in Modesto. That's the issue. And why I strongly recommend for this county to, to have racial and equity commission. That way we can talk about the funds and the program that got to be through the whole county and specific to minorities and groups that are being affected. That's not happening right now. Look the report you're, from you're the- You're repeating yourself, please. I, I can't let you speak in, in, um, in perpetuity, so wrap it up, please. Uh, you're, you're on your second go around, so oh, wrap it up. There's other, there's other people that need to talk. Okay, thank you, sir. I, so, I so the issue is, is please do a better job. Thank, thank you, you very much. Others? Yeah, Deborah, come on up. Your elected member, 
Congressman, I want to thank you very much for all of your effort. This is a very interesting because you have the you have the say, no matter what anybody says, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut on certain things. Um, I'm a, I just read the letter. Can you pull the, the mic down just a little bit? I just read it. the letter that the dynamics in this community counterproducts the funding that you're putting through it. You know, you have all kinds of dynamics. I'm going through it in multiple areas. It's counterproducting the money that you spend <coughs> on things. So it's not just about the money and the investment. You have to protect the dynamic of investing that money by how would you put, establishing a solid ground for that investment to be made in. It's, I, I'm still in shock. I can't even get over the fact that I'm being bamboozled and suspended and walking around town. There's a, a social aspect. There's the communication aspects. All these things have jammed me up jammed me up, and that can jam any project up that you start putting your investment in. So it's like, how can we balance, how, who and how can that be balanced out? Does somebody actually have to file a lawsuit? Can people talk about it? I mean, I couldn't reach people on just a small little thing like the library. You're talking about mega bucks. And it's all going to evolve eventually, but I just pray that everybody can protect the investment from the counterproductive stuff that doesn't, shouldn't exist. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm here uh, just to really in support of the Community Development Corporation. Uh, there's this model that is being implemented in our county is nothing like ever before. As we look at Sacramento County, you look at Stockton, you look at Fresno, these are areas that are injecting the economic development wealth and the, the well-being of its residents. And um, as we look at this model and opportunity, um, the window is very short. And so as you think about this opportunity, each one of you, um, it is an equitable approach to providing access to capital to individuals who are in underserved communities throughout Stanislaus County. In Stanislaus County, there's four low tracks. Primarily, the MSA of Modesto is the largest. However, there is other pockets, Empire, Grayson, Newman, all these areas that have a moderate tracks, about 14 or so, don't quote me on that. However, um, the opportunity is here. And so as you think about this next step, think about the next, the future. Um, some of them are here um, representing these communities and, and there is a myth that's ready to be handled and take forward, so thank you. Do you your name? My name is Jose. Jose, yeah. all right, Jose, thank you easier to identify in the me in minutes rather than gentleman in the black shirt. <laughs> Anyone else coming forward? All right. Seeing that, I'll bring it back to the board. And so uh, generally, again, we've been through briefings and we've, we've all had our opinions on what needs to be done. I think it's, it's important and I, I Supervisor Condit, Chance Condit, uh, to my left, talked about the infrastructure package, and, and this is a, a real opportunity, but yet the expectation that islands are going to disappear, there's enough money, is is probably not true. As we look at this once, maybe once in a lifetime, I don't know, once in a few years for sure, since I've been on the board, opportunity to, to attack some of these underlying issues. I don't believe federal money can be used to match federal money, so it's going to be state money and or local money. And trying to leverage, uh, like the active transportation grant, I think is our, our opportunity, so maybe the 50 million becomes 60 million. We do have to spend the money, allocate it in three years, we saw the timeline, so 
I'm just going through an active transportation grant, it's taken us about three years to get a project done. So it, it, it's not that easy. Um, I'm for regional equity. I, I always understand the first dollar has to be spent in Modesto. It is the largest municipality by a long shot, or the Modesto area, greater Modesto area. But uh, there are communities of need, and I just, I just heard uh, the gentleman, uh, Jose, talked about Grayson and Crow's Landing and Keys and Empire and Hickman, you can go on and on. There are plenty of, there's not a shortage of need. Uh, but I don't want people to expect that these county islands are going to disappear with 50 million under a probably 750 million, three quarters of a billion dollar need. Um, and uh, on the economic package, I mean, just, just looking at it, that could be very broad, the 30 million. I like to keep those as broad as possible to see where the real need ends up. I've been receiving letters as a chairman. Uh, when you guys are chairman, you'll find the letters always sent to you, and it is, it, there is no shortage of food banks and, and people that really rise to the top if you look at the basic need of people, but we're still trying to make a difference uh, long term. So, you know, you, I, I know there's a hundred sayings, but it's, you know, you give someone fish or you teach them how to fish or you teach them, you, know, you give them corn or you teach them how to plant corn. It, it's all along the same line. So if we can make the money, if we can change or transform our community, we have to look at that. And I don't, I, again, I don't uh, pretend to have the answers, but I know there's a lot of smart people around here uh, that, that can come up with solutions. So I'm okay uh, generally with the package. Uh, I know that was one of the questions when I met with uh, Joe, it was about regional equity. Uh, again, to make sure that money gets spent throughout the communities to, uh, where the need is. So those are just some of my thoughts. Uh, Supervisor Withrow? Just, sure, um, thank everybody, you know, Raul, Angelica, Patrice, everybody for the presentation. Um, long night, so we'll try to make this quick. But it's important stuff. You know, when we first started, um, when I first started 11 years ago, I know Vito first started, we, it, it's such a, it, it's, it's amazing how it's changed. We were struggling every day to try to figure out how to pay for services, how to continue just basic services for the county. Um, we were in the middle of the Great Recession. It was just, it was a nightmare that we were trying to, and like I said, all it was is trying to keep essential services in place. And now here we are today, you know, you know, we've got the federal government printing money and, and, and giving it to us, and we'll take it. You know, it's great. We'll take it. That's for sure. But, um, but, but we've got to figure out the way that wh where we're going to get the biggest bang, as Vito said, the biggest bang for our buck. You know, we want to spend this money and, um, and affect positive change in our community. That's what, we're gonna, that's what we want to do with this money is to make change, positive change in this community and help, um, help everyone. Um, and we don't want to just do one-time things, one-time projects, and we want this money to multiply, as you say. We want to, you know, we don't want to just buy food. We want to plant seeds. We want to plant orchards that are going to help for generations. All those, all those um, things we can um, quote off as far as, but that's what we want to do. We want this money to work for us. As Manny said, everybody has said, we've, you know, we've gone through this. We've been going through this for a while. We've met and spoken with staff, tried to figure out, um, what the best way is to spend this money. It's not like we're sitting here deciding this today. This, the, these agendas, they come to us after we have all been briefed and, and had our input on how this money is gonna be spent and where we think, and the staff comes with their, with their suggestions, and then we have our ideas, and then it, it continues to get worked until it gets back to us here. And so, so that's great. As I go through each one of these really quick, sorry, I'm trying to do this quick, because I, I, I think Joe's gonna fall asleep out there, I can see. So. Um, you know, is supporting families, the five million dollars for that, I, I think that's, um, that's great, individuals, families, um, and, and I think that's what government does, that's a great way to start, that's, that's, we're, we're good at that, trying to help with these, the, the, the people that, that need help, the people that, and the families, and, and, and just like we talked about here earlier with the, with the children, you know, we don't need to start new programs, we're doing that already, let's, let's, let's continue to fund that, and, and maybe ramp that up, that's great. Um, community infrastructure, as we've talked about here, we're, we're never going to have enough to be able to, um, to to take care of all the county pockets. But but as Edgar said, it, it, you know, it, it is all about leveraging. We all envision this about being about leveraging. You know, we put fifty million dollars towards this. You know, we've been talking about this for years. I know since I've 
been on the board and that we're trying to figure out ways to do something with, the, with these um, county pockets. This is a good start. This is the most we've ever thought about doing. It's not like we haven't th thought about doing it and, 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 and we want to get to those communities. Let's leverage, just take these funds and leverage and make a difference with these funds, which is basically what we're going to try to do with all these funds. So that's community infrastructure. There'll never be enough, but I'm hoping that envision that we can leverage and end up with a lot more money that will come in. Again, not enough to solve all of them, but it, it's going to be a good it's going to be a good beginning, and and we'll make progress. And we've been making progress on this over the last few years, as it is with our sewer and and, and water projects that we've been doing into these areas. So that's good. Community Development Corporation. Um, you know what I've noticed. It, it, just in the last year, and this is just through my accounting firm and, and, and seeing it, and, and some of you out there I'm sure have seen, a, as we've been in COVID, the haves and have-nots have continued to m move further apart. And, and, and even all the money the government has given in, through these PPP loans, um, I see it in my own clients. I see, I see people um, getting this money and, and not that everybody didn't need it, but there were so many that didn't get this money. And as government hands out this money, uh, it, it, it seemed to just exacerbate the distance between the haves and the have-nots, the ones who had the wherewithal and the ability to get it, got it, and the ones that didn't were um, just got further behind. So we've been talking about this for a while, the CDFIs, the, the you know, um, Community Development Finance Institute, the, um, and then the CDC that, that, that we're, we're looking to fund here. I think this is a great start. And um, I appreciate Joe and, and, and Jessica here and, 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 and Jose for the South Minnesota Partnership has been working on this stuff for a while too. You know, but I'm gonna say we expect great things to come out of this. Um, you know, we're gonna look for a return our on our investment out of this. And, and it's, what I see it is this is a seed money that we're doing that the county's putting in. This is not a county driven project this and this is the way it should be because I think there's you know there's this there's this um, false narrative out there that government um, will, can create jobs and, and government can't create jobs we know government can't create jobs that if they do they're temporary in nature and but but, but what we're doing to um, here is, is different and and it's, it's it's building partnerships and bringing people together in the private sector and the community-based organizations to do this so we're going to put seed money in here and then you guys are going to take it from here. And, and I think that's the best way to do it. It's organically created that way. And it's not a, it's not a gov another government project and another, oh, we're going to take this money and create these jobs. And, and, and that's where we get stuck so many times. It's not government driven. We're here to partner. We're here to be a, um, um, a backup for you. But we're looking for, for you guys to do all the work. And, and I think it'll have the best chance of success um, th through you bringing multiple agencies together. Um, and, and, and it won't just be this seed money because this, this money will just be the beginning and there's so many other opportunities for additional money then will come and, and be a part of, um, you know, whether it's the CDFIs or part of the CDC, all, it will bring other private sector money in, bank money in, all these good things. And so, so anyway. Um, like I said, we're not deciding all these things right here, right now. I know, I know we're looking to, to get the seed money in and get this started with the CDC, which we need to do. But there's, um, it's just the concepts that we're talking about here, and I totally support these concepts. Um, and am very um, excited about the possibilities here. And, and seeing it's just not taking the government taking this money and throwing it at something. And, and, and it just being temporary in nature and it'll eventually disappear and we'll be right back where we were before. We're talking about foundational, fundamental changes to our community that are gonna um, have positive effects for generations to come. So um, good stuff. I'd like to talk about this a lot longer, but I, I'm gonna let us all go home here eventually. And, but I think this is a great start. I appreciate staff and all the hard work they've done and all the input from my fellow board members, all the work from everybody in the community that's been a part of this and um, um, good things are gonna come for this. So thank you and I very much support this. Supervisor Condon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I promise I will be quicker than Terry. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that as I wouldn't go. take much effort. I'll talk as, <laughs> as fast as I could. I like the direction. It's about jobs, it's about the economy, it's about improving the quality of life of people in Stanislaus County. And I believe this is the direction to do that. We have more jobs, we have a booming economy, we can build more sidewalks. 
we can do more with our streets, more with our parks. So I think uh, this is a good direction and I'm ready to go. Appreciate it. And if there's nothing else, we'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the recommendation. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. Second. By Buck. Condit, Condit. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Raul, Angelica, Patrice, and Jody. Okay, on to correspondence. This board has received a copy of the Community Services Agency Fiscal Year 2020-2021 self-evaluation of the Child Care and Development Alternate Payment Programs for Stage 2 and 3 contracts. Acknowledge receipt of report. This board has received the claims as noted on the agenda. Acknowledge receipt of claims. Refer to the Chief Executive Office. Any Board of Supervisor reports? Impatience, no. Le legislative Fiscal Management report? Uh, yes, I, we should be talking about the state budget. I have to acknowledge the release of this, that may revise from the governor last <coughs> week. Um, we'll defer that to a future meeting. Thank you. And we do have an announcement, a workshop tomorrow. I, I'll go ahead and take it. Uh, Stanislaus County Board of Supervisors workshop is being held tomorrow at the Turlock Library Community Room on Wednesday, May 19th at 9 a.m. And the address is 550 Minaret Avenue Tur in Turlock, California. So it's the new library in the community room. Uh, the new and improved, the, the library is not quite, we haven't gotten to a ribbon cutting, but they are letting us use the, the uh, side room. So uh, come one, come all. Uh, looking around, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, this meeting is adjourned.